we're good. So I'm gonna go ahead and click back to our screen. So you guys should be looking at this document and this is really where we're gonna go next on our training. So now we're gonna be hitting sales process. So sales process, uh, as you can see, has a number of steps. Oh, did I hear someone chime in? Oh yeah, it was, I haven't muted. Uh, Knoxville yet. So we've got a number of steps that I teach. And again, I'm going to run over one by one. And on these bullet points, I'm going to give you just a real, real super basic kind of rundown of what we're going to cover and kind of a brief description of what it is. Then we're going to get into the real details of, of what it is. Okay. So pre-work. Pre-work is um, really going to be making sure you're prepared on time, your schedules, uh, you know, you know what your schedule is, you know, how long it's going to take to get there, you, you know, your uh, arrival to the home, you know, making sure you are aware of your surroundings that you, you kind of see and focus in on the right things. Um, your warm up. This is actually what I just had our first Zoom call uh, of and second Zoom call of the month. We did it. I did it yesterday, and I haven't posted it to YouTube yet. But we're going to cover the warm up. So I might even pull up my uh, my talking points from that uh, that Zoom call that I just did. Um, but the warm up is understanding why it's important and just some fun facts about it and better ways to to warm up with your clients or your prospects. Your uh, transition to the agenda. Uh, the agenda, again, is a very important piece of the sales process. If you don't do agendas with your customers, they're gonna, you're leaving it up to chance that they understand how the, the appointment's gonna go, and you're likely gonna lose attention and lose the sale. So the transition to agenda and agenda are very, very important. The needs assessment. So the needs assessment, we all kind of have a pretty good understanding. Uh, well, actually, you guys are, some of you are very new, so you don't. But the needs assessment is really uh, very specific in our world. So I'm going to go over in detail, question by question, and we're going to have some, uh, you know, some communication. I'm going to get you involved a little bit in reading these, these uh, needs assessment questions. So we understand why we ask them, and uh, really this is our roadmap and our customer telling us how to sell them. So the needs assessment is key. Um, the pitch book, we're gonna cover the pitch book as well, which is, again, you saw part of it in the very beginning, which is just going over our company history, what we do, where we're at, some average costs and stuff like that. Uh, iPad photos, design concepts, we're gonna double back to the photo section and I'll show you some things that you should be doing with your customers to help build, you know, give them a, an expectation of cost. Um, you're gonna price condition in this step. You're gonna give them help with design concepts in this step. There's a lot of things that, that you need to do uh, during this step that are important. Um, you're measuring and calculations. Now this is something that is very difficult for me to do virtually with you, so it's important that you do your homework afterwards if you haven't already done so and you really need to be fast at this this is this is key because you can really throw a wrench in an appointment if it takes you 20 minutes to calculate what kind of square footage they have or backsplash they have you need to do a be able to knock out a measurement quick um, you know at my peak I, I'm sure Glenn can attest to how fast he could measure a kitchen too. I could gather a square footage in less than five minutes. It didn't even take that long. And I could interact with my customer uh, at the same time. So again, if I was solely focused on measuring, I could knock that out in five minutes or less, no problem. And if you're taking longer than that, you're going to create a problem in your appointment. So uh, getting your customer to one color choice Again, that's something else that we'll cover. If you can't get a customer to pick a color or a finish, you're not going to sell it. You, you just, I mean, you're not going to say, well, yes, yeah, sure, here's four options and they're all priced the same. Yeah, go ahead and pick at your leisure. That's not going to close the sale. So you need to get really good at guiding the sheep. You know, your customers, I, I hate using this term because it sounds a little derogatory, but your customers are the sheep. They don't really know what they want sometimes, and you need to guide them to where they need to be. Um, and they're not, they're not, it's not their fault. They're just not necessarily good at making these types of decisions because it's their first time going through it. You're the expert, so you're there to try and help them make a good decision. Urgency close setup. Again, this is um, a little controversial. 
<laughs> so you don't have to use my exact techniques because not everybody agrees with them. But I, I think that's, I think it's silly. If you don't use mine exactly, you need to use some sort of urgency clothes. Create it on your own if you want. I don't advise that unless you come up with something that that you know works and you know you got a history of it. I know mine works, and again, it really is uh, a, a setup to give them a reason to buy today and not to call you back in a week or two weeks or three weeks. Recap in the Price Is Right game. This is again going to be a, a tool that you can use to extract their budget and what job, what kind of job you've done at building in value and price conditioning. So it's a very important step. How we go about price presentation, you know, what do we do after that? I don't know. You know, that's what we're going to cover. <laughs> porch lighting. How is, how do we porch light? What is a porch light? Um, when is it appropriate to do it? Negotiation. Again, that's a, a big part of it as well, which I also did a Zoom call on that. Um, and that's on YouTube but I'll probably pull up that presentation. And then the cool down, which is again, just kind of like the warm up. You're making sure you, you get your customer uh, feeling good about the process. So um, we're gonna jump right into the very first topic, which is our pre-work. So um, with us having the good fortune, is Glenn still there with you guys in Knoxville? Hey, Glenn. Hey. All right, Glenn, I'm, you're gonna get put on the spot here. You ready? Yeah. All right. So when, when you ran a sales call, when did you try to be there 10 minutes early, on time, or 10 minutes late? I like to be on time. All right. Good. So I uh, with this pre-work, my very first thing, of course, aside from knowing your schedule, is I would try to be on time or 10 minutes early to every appointment if I could. I'm a military guy. I came from the Army. So for me, that's a big deal is if you were on time, you were late. So I always tried to be a few minutes early if I could. doesn't matter if you're on time. That's okay, too. Either way, though, anytime I had the opportunity, I would call the customer just to even if I knew I was going to be on time. Um, and I knew that I wasn't going to be late, I, I really would call them anyways. If I was at an appointment, I would call them. And it does a couple of things by doing that. Number one, it, it kind of confirms, hey, reminder, I know you've been reminded a few times maybe, you've had a confirmation call, but I'm coming to your house to go look at your project, so make sure you're there, okay? That's one thing it does. Two, it helps establish a connection and rapport with the customer and may help you with your opening warm-up. So if I know, oh man, I'm going to be right on time, I'm still going to call and say, hey, I'm just getting ready to head out right now. Just wanted to give you a heads up. This is Matt from Trend Transformations, Granite Transformations, whatever your franchise is. And um, I, I, there's a chance I might be a minute or two behind. Hopefully I'll be right, right on time. But you know, I'm just now leaving my place right now. I wanted to give you the heads up just so I can respect, be respectful of your time. So again, you're, you're doing a couple of things with that. But then if you've talked and you, let's say you do hit some traffic, maybe you're two minutes late or whatever, or you're five minutes early, you know, you'll have an opening conversation point about maybe traffic or the weather or something like that. Again, all things that can start this very awkward, hey, I'm a stranger and I'm in an hour and a half going to ask you for an eight to $10,000 sale. You, you know, you can, you can definitely, you got to break the ice. <laughs> there's not, there's not an easy way to go in an hour and a half to two hours and ask for that type of sale. So you got to really get them to like you, you know, so uh, any way you can get them talking and, and, all that is good. So your pre-work would include making sure you dress professionally. Um, I have shadowed with some reps, um, females and males, that are not dressed uh, appropriately. I mean, it's not like they're wearing mini skirts or they're wearing cut-off t-shirts. I'm not talking about that. I'm saying that they're not dressed like a sales professional. If you don't have logo wear for your location, that's okay. Um, you, you know, I get it, but you need to be, you need to look the part. If you look like a random person that's just coming in their house, it's going to be tough to overcome that, that look. And uh, again, making sure your sales kits are in order is another big part of your pre-work. You should not have a bunch of old dirty samples that are jacked up. You shouldn't, I, I'm personally not a big fan of the old sales kits that we always used to put the stickers on the front of the samples because they inevitably rub off on each other and it creates this sticky, nasty mess on the top of your sample, which is not going to show well for you. Um, so go through and regularly audit your sales kit. Pull your stuff out 
and make sure that everything's in good order, that you've got the mosaics looking good, the, the tile, the samples for the, the countertops looking good. Um, you need to be prepared with these things and you need it to look right. I used to have a, a big pet peeve, any rep that I trained, that I would audit theirs on pretty much every other sales meeting, if not every sales meeting, just because it was so common, I would find their stuff was disgusting. And again, it, you gotta, you're gotta, you gonna be asking for a premium dollar, a premium price for this project. You have to look and you, you, know, you gotta be part of that process and make sure you're projecting that type of value. Or sorry, uh, I should say that that you justify that type of price that you're gonna you're gonna ask them for. So um, it, it is. I, I'm sure you guys don't all know this yet, but does anybody use the new sales kits or does everyone use the old sales kits? I have no idea. You have no idea. So you don't know what your sales kit looks like yet, Kelly, right? Well, I have a sales kit with like a folder, and I've also got like a couple boxes of different samples okay. and all of mine are new so I know that they look good. Is it a gray bag that's branded with our company or no? All right, so that's an old sales kit. That's okay. What about there in Knoxville? Does anybody use the new sales kit or is it all the old stuff? Old. Old. Okay. And I think I think in Phoenix, I don't know if you guys use them or not. Either way, it doesn't matter. If you use old or new, the steps are the same. One thing that I would recommend you do that I know for a fact in the old kits I rarely saw is go to Joann's or, or someplace where you can get some black fabric or something like that that's nice that you can lay out on your customer's house. You're going to be in a customer's house sometimes that has these crazy blue countertops or pink countertops, and it's really distracting to try and look at these colors in their space if you've got all those nutso colors going on around you. So use use a black cloth or something like that. Get it down. It's like kind of like what you see at a jewelry store, you know, where you can show a sample and not not have it be too distracting with the surrounding colors that you're dealing with. Now, um, once that's done and your sales kits are in order and all that stuff's done and you're arriving at the home and you've made your call, again, if you choose to do that, this is where your work really starts. Your work starts with really observing your surroundings, kind of understanding and dissecting the type of person that you're about to interact with. So it sounds complicated, but it'll start to come to you more naturally as time goes on. So if you go to a person's home and they've got a very clean manicured lawn, stuff like that. And they're, you know, you may have a, a talking point. You may see, um, you know, they've got tons of lawn ornaments or, you know, you don't know what you're going to run into, but you need to observe and make sure you understand at least some traits that you may be dealing with out of that customer. All right. Um, now, if, if that person keeps a super well manicured lawn and everything's super neat and tidy and you can tell, as you get to the door, you probably need to always offer to remove your shoes. I always did that at every place is offer at least, hey, would you like me to remove my shoes? Is this a shoe-free household or is it okay for me to leave them on? And again, if if they want you to take them off, take them off. But you, you don't want to have anything be distracting. If Does anyone here, Kel, Kelly or anyone there, do, do you guys have a shoe-free household situation going on? No? Well, the people that do are like hyper vigilant and they get annoyed and distracted if they see people walking around on their carpet with dirty shoes on. So they don't know what your shoes are. You don't want to distract them by thinking, oh God, are they getting my carpet dirty? You know, I don't, I don't, you don't want to even deal with that. So just ask, is it okay that I leave my shoes on or would you like me to take them off? That's where you start. Now, our warm up. I'm actually going to use a visual aid on this, and since I just did this presentation, so give me two seconds. Um, Zoom agenda four. I'm going to pull it up real quick. So um, the warm up is one that is is really kind of taken for granted at some sometimes I mean it's not uh, as salespeople we naturally assume that we're we're like amazing at warm-ups because we can connect with anybody at any time but I really feel like this is worth spending some time on all right cool so I'm gonna get to this presentation just one second all right so if 
Kelly, if you'd be so kind, please confirm once you see a big orange screen. Yes. All right, cool. So uh, I'm just going to read our, the presentation that I just did for warm-ups. So uh, again, as you can see here, it's a well-established fact. And you can still see it, right, Kelly? Yes. Yes. All right. So, you know, we this is basically saying that uh, we we think that we can sell anybody um, and again, they, they, they will buy from people they like essentially is what I put on there. Warm up should be organic, not forced. So again, you're not going to deal with every customer just instantly warming up to you. They warm up differently. And again, you need to make sure you're aware of what's going on and you can read the room. Um, it, you're, you're really not always connecting with them. Basically you, you think you may be but uh, again, salespeople, naturally, we go in there and we do this. We talk, 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 talk. We try to sell them something. And again, we don't really listen to what they're saying. And we don't know if there's a real connection going on. So make sure you slow down when you're talking to them. Kind of make sure you guys are really, truly engaged in a two-way conversation. And you're finding connection points that, that will help you. Because if they like you, they will buy from you. Um, you know, again... You want to ask open-ended questions. So can you, well, you can see them all here. Can you, do you understand, Kelly, what I'm talking about when I'm dealing with an open-ended question? It's really trying to engage them in a conversation. So, you know, if I notice, for instance, that they've got pictures of their kids all over their home, I'm going to ask about their kids or their grandkids. And I have kids, so it's easy. I can make a connection point right there. You know, if they have dogs and I can see that, you know, they're very passionate about their dogs or their cats. I've had cats as pets when I was younger and now I have dog, you know, a dog. So I can talk to them about that. Really, you're going to try to engage them and find common grounds on whatever their interests are. And the ones that help specifically with the males, because those that haven't done this before, you're going to realize that males are sometimes tougher to crack than females because they don't necessarily want to spend money on this project. They're not drivers of this project. So if they're not the driver of this project, they're naturally going to be closed off and a little bit resistant. You're going to see it in their, their body language. You're going to sit back with their arms crossed. They're not going to talk to you. They're going to give you one word answers at best. So the ones that I always used or I tried to use were ones that I could open them up as well. You know, usually that's things like golf or football or cars or, you know, and it doesn't mean you have to be an expert. You can just ask and try to let them teach you something. Ask them to, see, you know, have it more of a learning type environment. You want to try to, oh, that's an awesome car. Where, where is, where'd you get that from? Did you restore that yourself? I, I've never, you know, I don't know anything about that, but it looks amazing. You know, you don't have to try to pretend to be something you're not, but try to connect with those guys, especially the ones that are not the drivers necessarily, because oftentimes they can be a roadblock later, uh, later on in the appointment. So again, these are just some uh, examples of different warm up questions uh, that are open ended. Uh, I like your backyard. It's amazing. Did you landscape it yourself? You know, you're trying to ask something that will either lead to a follow up question or have more than a one word response. So that's what you want out of your open ended questions. So when it's not working, again, you try to force it, it's going to create more bad than good. So I'm a big proponent of just Read the situation. If you read it and you say, you know what, I can tell on my attempts here to warm up are failing miserably, then just move on. And as time goes on, you can start to chip away. Doesn't mean you abandon the warm up. It just means that you move on. They're more business focused in the beginning, and that's okay. So you're going to continue to be a likable person. You're going to then move on to your transition to the agenda, which we're going to cover next. And then again, you can continue to hit them as time goes on because you're going to be asking them a series of questions in the needs assessment anyways, and that could lead to some additional questions and, and you could find some common ground in places like that as well. So again, I've already kind of talked about it, but make sure you're paying attention to the body language. Make sure you're, you're, uh, you're not getting consistent one word answers. Those are all ways for you to tell what's going on. So the transition to the agenda. So this is, um, for those of you, again, that are brand new and haven't run sales calls before, if you get called out to run a bathroom appointment, there are some that are going to try to have you set up in a bathroom for your appointment, which is not ideal for a presentation. It's cramped. 
Again, it's just not a good place to do a presentation. So before you even go to look at their project, if it is an upstairs bathroom, uh, you need to ask this question, which is, uh, do you have a space where I can set up and we can begin? So you're gonna basically, you're alluding to, you need to set up at a table or you know maybe a, a, a dining room, doesn't matter, kitchen, you know that's a great place to set up. And you need to get them grounded so you can go over the agenda of this appointment. What is this appointment gonna look like? All right, now we're gonna cover the agenda next. So the agenda, <laughs> again, Today's generation, especially when you're dealing with a younger generation and demographic, what's your number one uh, problem with them usually? It's this, all right? So you're gonna be dealing with a lot of people that are addicted to their phones and can't stay off of it. And if they don't understand what you're getting ready to propose or go over how the appointment's gonna look, they're gonna have a tendency to be distracted and that's gonna be a problem. That's not usually as much of an issue with an older generation, but still it's important to go over what this appointment, what is this appointment gonna look like? Cause you gotta think in terms of your customer, your prospect, have they been through this process before likely? No, this is probably their first time uh, going through a home remodel, maybe it's their second, maybe they've gone to get a quote at Lowe's or Home Depot, but the in-home sales process is not something that most are experts at. So it's important that you tell them what this appointment's gonna look like. So once you're grounded and you've actually had a chance to sit down in a place, you can say, okay, the goal of the meeting today is to learn what you would like to achieve with this project and whether we're a good fit for each other. So that that's key. You are not there to just simply be one-sided. I'm trying to sell you right now. You need to make them understand, we have times where we're not a good fit for a customer, and so we try to ask a series of questions, you know, essentially, which is the next thing, to find out, are we gonna be able to do what you, you wanna do? Normally, that, the answer is yes, but there are occasions where we're not a good fit, and we won't waste your time, I won't waste mine, I'll, I'll point you in the right direction. You know, so you're, you're really gonna make it seem like it's a two-way street. So that's what that second bullet point says. I'll start by asking you a few questions about your project, which is the needs assessment, and then you'll let me know, uh, I'll let you know if we'll be able to do what, what it, the work is that you want, you want us to, to do here, or what your project entails. What, what's the scope of work? Can we do it? Is that in our wheelhouse? I'll then tell you about us, which is the pitch book. Uh, this will let you know more about how our company operates and what we can offer. So this will give you an opportunity to tell me, oh, you know what? Actually, we were looking for someone to paint our countertops, not not install new countertops. Sorry about the mix up. You know, so you need to, well, I'm gonna tell you about us, so then you can let me know, oh no, you're a fit or you're not a fit. I'll then show you some pictures of work we've done. This is where my iPad program and iCloud sharing program comes in, but usually you'll have some pictures available to you even if you don't subscribe to that. But we're gonna show you some pictures of work we've done, make some initial design recommendations, measure, and assuming that we can come to the final selections on your finishes, which most of our customers do, uh, we can provide you a cost to the penny for your project. So again, that's, that's kind of one, two, three, what you're gonna do, but then you're gonna, you're gonna really hit it hard by saying, please be aware we must select finishes your countertop color, we have to select options for me to be able to price this for you. If I can't get you down to your color, you know, our colors are different prices and you know, we order in different ways, so I need to know exactly what it is that you want us to use for your project, which I'll help you with, don't worry. If at any point you don't feel that we're the right fit for you, please tell me. I have no problem with a no thanks. Um, you know, we have a lot of interested customers to see and the last thing I want to do is waste your time or, ha you know, I don't want to waste my time. So don't feel like you can't just be honest with me and say, hey, this isn't really what I was looking for. It's okay. And again, if you give them that empowerment to say no, it'll help you down the road. Next, this is kind of like your verbal contract that you've just presented them with the appointment. You've told them exactly what's going to happen. So now you need to say, okay, may we proceed? So you're getting a yes, let's go ahead and move forward, or no, actually, I don't have time for this. Okay, great, well, let's reschedule. You know, 
Hopefully you don't get a lot of those, but if you do, that's why you ask this agenda because you need them to understand what you're gonna do in that appointment. If you just blow right past this and run right into, okay, what are we looking at? And then you just start measuring and stuff, they may think, oh, he's gonna be done in 15 minutes, 20 minutes. That's good, because I got a therapy appointment in 45. You know, if you go over the agenda and you tell them exactly what you're gonna do, that's going to change things a little bit. They're going to understand, oh, this is going to require some attention on my part, and this is going to be an interactive back and forth thing. You know, they're going to know it's not going to be super fast. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I'm going to close out of this one because that pretty much hits the agenda points that I wanted to do. We're going to go back to this document here. So um, we've now covered the pre-work. We've covered a warm-up what that looks like, the transition to agenda, which is a very simple, do you have a place where we can sit down where we can begin, or a place where I can set up where we can begin? We've actually just gone over the agenda, which is telling them, here's the map, here's my verbal contract of what we're gonna do in this appointment, can we proceed? Yes? Okay, great. Then you're gonna move on to your needs assessment. So the needs assessment, we're gonna make this a little bit more interactive. I'm going to, you guys did, was everyone able to download the uh, link that I gave you? No? The, the perfect sales process, does it, anybody get that downloaded or no? I don't see it anywhere. So it was in the chat, it was the we transfer thing that I sent you guys? It's all right, I'll, I'll pull it up here. Yeah, I'll pull it up, and then once it's pulled up, we should it should be big enough for everybody to see. So I'm going to stop share with that, and then I'll start sharing this so everybody can see it. And we're going to trade off, and we're going to go over each one of these in detail. Okay? So can you guys see that screen now? Yes. All right, so the very first one, why don't you go ahead and take it, Kelly, because you're not muted currently. Oh, am I just reading? Yep, just read the first bullet point. How long have you been in your home? Okay, so you're going to see a common theme with all of these is you're asking questions. Again, as a reminder, the needs assessment is essentially your roadmap to how do I sell this person? How am I supposed to be selling this person? What do they need out of this project? Or what what um, a wound that I can use that's going to benefit our option for them and make them see that we're the right fit for them. Um, so how long have you been in your home? That tells you a couple of things. That tells you, all right, so uh, I just moved here or I've been here 20 years. Those are very important things to know. Um, the next one, we're going to go ahead. I know Tennessee has a few people in the room. Do we still have Doug with you there in Tennessee? Yes. yes. All right, so Doug, why don't you go ahead and yep. read the next one? Uh, is this project for you or for someone else? Yeah, so you're asking that because you want to find out what commitment level they have to it, one. But two, you're trying to understand, are the, is the purpose of this project for resale or is it for them that are staying in their home? The next question, you guys want to take it there in Phoenix? Sure. How long have you been thinking about doing this particular project? So this can possibly open up a wound. You know, if that person tells you, good God, we moved in here five years ago. Uh, we didn't really like the countertops. But then about two years ago, we had a, a holiday party. Somebody brought a crock pot. And you can see I've got my cutting board there because I'm trying to hide a burn. You know, you will get that from time to time. So you're trying to open up and expose a wound potentially and remind them how long it's been that they've been wanting to do this project. So... Um, that that's really uh, a beneficial one. And you may also just say, hey, well, the, you may pull a, a little nugget of information that is very valuable as well. Something like, well, you know, actually, I've been wanting to do this for the whole time we've been here, but we haven't had the money and we just had an inheritance. So you, you learned a very valuable piece of information right there, too. So that's why you want to ask these questions. Kelly, you want to take the next one? Uh, what made you give us a call at this point in time? What's changed? So, boom, you're going to get maybe a, a call to action. You may get, oh, well, we have a party, a graduation party. We need to get this done before then. Or you could get that, that inheritance uh, thing there as well. You're just trying to find out why now? What, what changed if you've been wanting to do this for five years? Why am I here today and why wasn't I here five years ago? 
So that's that's the reason you asked that question. Next, you want to you want to take that one there in Knoxville. Have you done any other home improvement projects? Yeah, so I actually used to use this one um, pretty early on in the process. I would say, you know, hey, is this your first time doing a home improvement project? Or have you ever done a project of this type? And then, you know, I actually started to alter it as well. So have you or your family members or any friends, has anyone that you've known ever been through a project like this before? Because you're trying to kind of get a, a feeling for, Oh yeah, I just moved two years ago. I did granted in my other place. They'll tell you a lot of information. So it's going to, again, tell you before you put your foot in your mouth, what kind of experience they maybe have already had, what products they're familiar with. It's a very valuable question. Most of the time, they're going to say, no, I haven't done a project like this before, or I haven't done home improvement projects, especially in the kitchen. And that's good because you're, again, trying to remind them, hey, you're not the expert here. I'm the expert. So let me guide you through this process. Next, who's up? Is how, that, was, okay, go ahead. how was that experience for you? Yeah, how was that experience for you? So again, let's say they say yes, you may open a wound. Oh, well, this sucks. So Doug, I know you were uh, you were in painting before paint sales, right? So exactly. if, you, if you had somebody, we actually talked on the phone about this. So you may get that question from them or that you may ask this question. They may say exactly what we talked about on the phone. Hey. Hey, Doug. So you may get that. What? Uh, what did we talk about? Well, if you get somebody who says uh, that, that they didn't have a good experience, you want to ask a lot of questions about that. Right. You want to down. You want to bring up that emotion. Uh, because unless you bring up that emotion, you can't address the fact that it will be different. Yep. So if you're talking, what we talked about too on the conversation is, is, is very rampant in this industry as well, is subs, subcontractors. So I used to use that to my advantage all the time. If they had Home Depot or Lowe's do a fence form, I was like, thank God, because I know how their system worked. What they did was they sold a fence at Home Depot or Lowe's. They had a list of subcontractors and they handed it to the one that was basically willing to take the least amount of money for it. Which do you think that was the highest quality of work? No. So it's it played into our favor because we don't subcontract our work. So you're gonna you, this will give you a very valuable piece of information. Now that's not to say. By the way, anytime you're asking these questions, it's okay if they ask some follow up questions or you ask follow up questions. But the goal of this is literally to be there taking notes, sitting down taking notes or mental notes at the minimum. All right. And I don't, I don't recommend that you actually have this needs assessment in a physical paper necessarily. You don't have to do that. I would have it like on an iPad or on a computer or something like that so you can look at it. Because if they see that you're about to ask them 35 questions, you're going to get some pushback. They're going to be like, oh my gosh, can we just hit look at the kitchen already? You know, sometimes you're going to get that. So if you just tell them, hey, look, I'm trying to learn more about this project and what you need, that's a whole different ballgame. And then they won't even know. You're just going to start a a conversation with them. So um, after, how was that experience for you? Do you want to take that one there in Phoenix again? So we're on this, uh, this, this one right here. I'm taking notes here. How would you like your next experience? So this is an obvious question for many reasons, but the most obvious of them is, okay, so what went wrong before so we can make this better this time for you? And I can understand what I need to highlight in my presentation. All right, next, Kelly. What do you like about your kitchen or bath? So <laughs> I always bring this up because I many times stuck my foot in my mouth. And I, I would go and assume things that were silly to assume. Oh, well, clearly we're here because your backsplash is awful. Oh, really? My <laughs> husband just did that last year. Okay, whoops. Sorry about that. Or man, those those cabinets, what a hack job. Who did that painting job on those cabinets? Oh, I did that. Oh, okay. Well, sorry about that. I mean, they look great. I mean, obviously, I was just kidding. You know, you don't want to get into that, that realm. So you need to understand what they love about their kitchen or bath or whatever project you're looking at so you can understand, all right, so maybe if they love their cabinets, I don't go after the cabinet refacing business. I only go after the countertop and backsplash. Make sense? All right, next, Tennessee. 
What don't you like about your kitchen or bath? Yeah, so now we're going to find out what's priority here. You got me out here because you know we can do a million things. So what are we what, what are we looking at here? I mean, what don't you like? What's number one on the list? A, I have to do this. The countertops are the worst. Next would be the backsplash. Then the cabinets. You know, you kind of get a one, two, three. So next... Um, what what do you have visualized for your backsplash? Yeah, so it's, well, what do you have visualized for the project? So do you have a vision for this? Do you have a Pinterest, um, you know, page that you saved? Do you have a magazine cutouts? What, 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 do you have a vision of what you want this to look like already? Or, or, and it's okay if you don't, but what do we, what do we have in mind for this project? What do you have visualized? So that's important because if you go in and propose all white countertops and they like all black countertops, that's, that's an issue. You can't just assume control of the design process. You need to first understand where they're at in their mind for vis the visual and then uh, assist them from there. The next one is what you mentioned, which is what do you have visualized for your backsplash? I put this question in there because it forces you to ask about the backsplash. Too many sales reps are so worried about getting a sale that they're scared if they bring up something, it might kill their sales opportunity because, man, this is going to be too expensive for them. If I, they just brought me out for countertops, so I don't want to go pushing for a backsplash because then I'm going to add on 2000 bucks or 2300 bucks, and then that's going to be out of budget. I'm not. They play all these games, and they've made their decision in their mind before they've ever asked their customer. And so I think it's important in this needs assessment, and that's why I think this is a good non-threatening way to do it, is you can just simply ask, what do you have visualized for your backsplash? Oh, you know what? I hadn't even thought of that. I had, if I had a nickel for every time I had that response, I mean, it was very common that people were not even, un they were, you know, I didn't even think about that. And then it started a nice conversation for me. Oh, well, yeah, you know, actually, I'll show you some pictures in a little bit when we go over the design concept, but... You know, what's the first thing you see when you walk into this room? You see your backsplash, right? You don't even see your countertop. Now, I'm not saying let's abandon the countertop here. I'm just saying, you know, it's common people don't even think about the backsplash, but it's a great way to give that wow factor and really make it pop. You know, that's what's going to make your kitchen go, ooh, you know, that's amazing. So, next question up. I think Phoenix is up, maybe. What is more important to you, the performance or the price? So I asked this question, and you can kind of tell, and I used to use my very minimal knowledge in cars. <laughs> I know a little bit. I know enough to be dangerous. So I would maybe see their car outside, and I, I could tell they didn't use a baseline model. So this already gave me a little bit of an indicator, or I looked around their home, and I know electronics pretty well, so I could see what kind of electronics they have what kind of computers they have. So let's say they use a Mac, then I could say, well, I can see, you know, already, you got a nice Mac there, you had a nice car out in the driveway, you're not really a base baseline model type of person, but you, you know, is this more important or is this more important, performance or price? Because if they're Mac buyers, odds are they're spending a premium dollar on something they think is gonna perform better. Or if you don't, you know, they get a nice car that's got a lot of bells and whistles to it, they're not gonna, you know, if they're getting a, a Honda Civic, <laughs> that's different than if they're getting an Acura. Okay, it's made by the same company, but it's two completely different, you know, cars. And again, they're using premium parts in one and not in the other. So you're gonna by asking this question, you're gonna get a feel for what type of buyer am I dealing with here? Am I dealing with someone that's always gonna try to go get the cheapest price, or are they willing to spend a little more if they they perceive that they're getting better performance out of the of what they're buying? Make sense? Next one, Kelly, I think it's you. All right, are you planning on installing a new sink and fixtures? So many of your clients, um, probably you're, you're gonna be shocked by this. They're not gonna even realize, oh crap, I didn't even think about that. And, and again, it's something that you need to remind them of and start to plan for. I actually used to you know, use this to my advantage a lot because people would not think about their sink and fixtures. 
and we would say, you know, hey, well, you know, we're going to have to disconnect everything, take the sink out as part of the process. So it's a good idea to uh, to kind of get your your forever sink or your permanent sink in place, which I assume is not that that beauty that the builder left you with, right? That little crappy drop-in sink. I mean, of course, you're not going to say it like that, but that's what you're trying to you know project is you're trying to say, hey, look, you're you're obviously not going to want to live with this sink forever. So let's focus on you know what kind of look you have in mind or you know what are you trying to get out of this uh, the sink or the you know and maybe a new faucet. Next up on the list, let me try and go down here. Next, go How ahead. How do you clean your kitchen sink? For example, do you do a lot of hand washing? So hand washing uh, does not mean soap on the hands like this. It means hand washing pots and pans. So those of you that are new to the industry, that is a very important thing to take note of. Um, usually you can tell by looking at their sink. Okay, is do they have a drying rack out? If they have a drying rack out, odds are they do a lot of hand washing of their pots and pans. They don't use a dishwasher as much. And there are certain sinks that we offer that are better for those types of individuals than others. So, you know, we have uh, what's called a super single sink. It's a big single basin sink. And again, those are nice for people who maybe put skillets, pots and pans, cookie sheets, stuff like that in the sink and they like to wash them. And you can almost play on their hatred of their current sink of, hey, you know how when you try and soak a pot or pan and you have to lean it up on the sidewall of the sink and, you know, you can't ever keep water in there to soak. It's kind of a pain in the butt and you got to throw it on your countertop and it sloshes all over the place. And it's, you know, you can really paint a picture and now they need this sink that they didn't even think of before, right? So that's uh, that's why you asked that question. Uh, next, the follow-up question for that is if yes, which side of your sink do you use for washing and do you use a drying rack? So... Uh, you, you'd be surprised how easy it is to impress people in these situations. So you can just look at their sink configuration and say, well, clearly it looks like you wash on your left and you dry on your right. And they're like, well, how'd you know that? And it's, well, they're drying racks on one side or the other. <laughs> or you can just see because there are some dirty dishes maybe in there. I mean, you can, you can typically tell and just bring that up. And the reason you ask that is, again, with our sinks, you can have some big bowls on the left, big bowls on the right. You know, there are different configurations for sinks that a lot of people don't realize that you can get. Next on the list, you guys want to take it there in Tennessee? How old is your garbage disposal? Uh, actually, next one's uh, oh, what, kind of, what kind of faucet did you have in mind? Right. So um, this gives you an opportunity if your location offers faucets, which most, I think all of you guys offer faucets. But I could be wrong. Um, but your, your faucets, you, this is, gives you an opportunity to say, hey, we can be a one-stop shop and take care of it for you. Or, you know, we can have you go pick up a faucet. I would recommend that we provide it for you because the ones that you get at your Lowe's, your Home Depot's, you know, those are typically a little cheaper. You know, every company of a, every manufacturer of a faucet, Moen, Delta, they, they have their kind of premium line. And then they make a plastic version of it that they sell to the big box stores so they can offer a cheaper rate. Um, that's usually why they keep them up high enough to where you can't touch or feel them because they're not usually the highest quality faucets. We offer super high quality faucets that are lifetime warrantied. Here's the little, when you bring it up that way, it, it, just so you know, every faucet is, as far as I know, lifetime warrantied. <laughs> they're even the, the cheap ones, but these don't break down. If you talk about how great the quality of your faucets are, you may be able to get them to also look into a faucet for you. And like he said, um, the old, how old is your garbage disposal? I, I use this as a, hey, just, you know, food for thought. You say you've been in this home 10 years. Have you ever changed the garbage disposal? No? All right, well, as I said before, we're taking everything apart. So it's an ideal time for us to look into maybe replacing that for you. Are you picking up a garbage disposal and having it here for the plumber? You know, it's just a good, it's a good, you know, service you can provide your client. All right, so next question up. Would that be me? Sure. Tell me how you feel about your cabinets. Are you happy with the color and the style? Yeah, hopefully by the by this time earlier in the questionnaire, you know, you or the needs assessment, you've asked them, hey, is this, you know, what do you hate about your kitchen? What do you like about your kitchen? And if they've not mentioned anything about the cabinets, just like the backsplash, you want to talk about the cabinets. You want to say, hey, tell me about your cabinets. Are they changing? You know, and I always used to start by saying, Look, a major point of reference when we're helping you design your kitchen and pick color for your countertop and do backsplash 
is your cabinet color and style. So, you know, do you, are there any plans to change that? I mean, tell me about them. Are you happy with it? Is that, does that have potential for change? If it does, we need to take that into consideration when we're making recommendations, you know, and by the way, we do cabinet refacing. Do you know what that is? No. Well, I'll show you some pictures here in a little bit of before and afters, and you can see what it looks like. But, um, you know, essentially it's a way to update your cabinets and color and style without having to tear up your whole kitchen. But we'll get into that in just a little bit when we, we talk about what services we offer. Next. Are there any other home improvement projects being planned at this time? So clearly you're asking this because you want to know, all right, are we doing windows? Are we doing roof? Are we doing a patio? What else are we doing? You know, are there, or you may get, hey, we're also doing our bathroom upstairs. We got bath fitter that came out and gave us a bid. Well, I'll show you some install pictures of our bathrooms because we actually usually aren't that much different in cost and we have a, a different look. So might be a look you like, maybe you hate it, but I'll just show you some when we get to the photos portion of it. So that's why you asked that question. Next. Kelly? Do you have a time oh, that you would like the project completed? Yeah, so uh, you're trying to see, is there already a built-in urgency? And Doug, we talked about this on the phone a little bit. Um, it's a little different situation than what you went into previously. And for those of you that have not been in the in-home sales environment, the goal of this appointment is to sell the job in this appointment, this one appointment. This is not a two-touch, three-touch approach. Um, in some circumstances, you kind of you may have to go down that road, but one call close is our most effective strategy with this company. So it, it's important that you know you may be able to naturally get that information from uh, the customer if you ask them, "Hey, is there a time frame in which we need this done by?" Um, and, and if they tell you, "Yeah, I've got a graduation party," or "Yes, I need it done by this for sure," that's some that's some good info to know. Uh, next, Kelly. All right. What other materials are you considering for your kitchen or bath? All right. So that's huge. Again, salespeople are scared to ask this question for some insane reason because they don't want to, I assume, maybe bring up that there's other options out there. Uh, I'm going to kill. I'm the. I'm going to dissolve this mystery for you. Customers know there are other countertops than us out there, so it's okay to talk about. I think it's very healthy for you to talk about not only what other materials, but what other companies are looking at. Um, because if they, if you don't know that, you, you're gonna have you're gonna have a hard time. Which leads to that next question, which is what other companies are you considering, and have you had any quotes? Now, listen, as new sales associates, Kelly, I don't know what your background is because we didn't talk before you were hired. But um, if you've never been in sales or in home sales, you, you got to get prepared for one very common thing that a customer says, which is, you know, you're I'm getting three bids and you're the first of three bids. You're going to magically always be the first bid. It's crazy. <laughs> and it's them really trying to protect themselves from having to make a decision. And that's OK. You just need to let that roll off your back. It's still important to ask if they've had any quotes and then also understand who they've had quote the job. Does that make sense, Kelly? Yeah. All right. So next question. How much are you hoping to invest in this project? That is a question that, again, people are sometimes squeamish about. But really, um, I always share this story when I'm doing my trainings. And it, and it, again, was an amazing opportunity when I was in sales still for this company uh, at a local franchise. And I, I went to a home. And I went through this. I was at this stage in the process, and I asked them this question. They were looking at cabinets, counters, backsplash, and they said, "You know, we really hope that we can keep this within about forty thousand dollars." Now, you guys that are new don't know this yet, but you would be salivating if you heard that come out of a customer's mouth, <laughs> because that means they've got a lot of money they want to spend, and they got a lot of work they want you to do, and that's a very nice sale. I think it was forty or thirty. I want to say it was forty, though. But I, you know, of course, have to pay. You have to put a poker face on and say, ah, if we're careful, we can, we may be able to keep it within forty thousand dollars. So you, you definitely want to ask this question because you're not going to get a response every time. But even if you get forty percent of your customers answer this question, that's amazing. 
you know, and it's valuable information to have as you're going into your process. So I don't really like the way this is worded, but it is important to ask early in the process. So if someone take this one, let's say, uh, say Tennessee. Are you interested in financing options? We have no interest financing or maybe monthly payments. So you guys all need to check with your owners to see what kind of financing programs you guys offer. But I, um, we're going to cover this in a, in a future Zoom meeting most likely. But it, it's one that you need to bring up early and often. And you have to know the clientele and how they respond. So for those of you that are new and haven't sold financing before, you know, I would say a 50 to 60 percent of projects that are over five thousand dollars in the home improvement industry as a whole are financed. All right, so uh, that is a lot, and our average ticket's about six thousand dollars. So that should tell you something that you should be able to offer financing. That's almost expected. But how you approach the financing option is very different for age groups. So if you go with an older customer. They're not going to want to finance naturally because that's just how they're wired. Younger generations are more open to financing. So when you're talking to an older customer, um, you, you know, 40s, 50s, 60s, whatever their age group, you just need to approach with a little more caution and word it differently. And word it maybe something like, you know, some of my smartest customers are very savvy with their money. They like playing with other people's money. So we actually have some no interest options. And if you want to take advantage of them, we just want to make sure you, you're aware that we have those options. 12 months, 24 months, same as cash. So you get to basically do this project on someone else's dime and, you know, invest your money elsewhere until you're ready to pay it off. You know, you can bring it up that way. You know, if hey, you, I have a, a, a question, how you feel about something that I say. Okay, go ahead. Financing. I, I tell the people, um, you know, my office may call in and do a survey on whether I told you everything or not. So I want to make sure that I let you know we do have some great financing, 12 months, same as cash. So if that's something you might be interested in, just let me know. Yeah, so, that's, that's great. I mean, whatever forces you to talk about financing, that's great. And again, if that organically comes out of you and you're just wired to, to do it that way, that's perfect. Um, I think that, um, again, depending on your client, your audience, you need to adjust your, not how you deliver your pitch, just how you word some of this stuff. Probably, you know, you, you definitely want to make sure, you know, we have some monthly payment options would be a good thing for a younger generation. And, you know, we can, you can use someone else's money if you want to. And we have some same as cash options as well. But, you know, you want to be cautious on how you bring up financing, and that's a good way to do it. Because if you bring it up the wrong way, they're going to and they're gonna think you're insinuating that you can't, that they can't afford that project, which is going to really piss them off or turn them off. And, you, again, you don't want to do that, especially this early in the, in the process. So that's a good way to bring it up. I assume, was that Amy that said that? I'm, I can't see. Yes. Okay. So, yeah, Amy, you're, you're right on the money. Bring it up and say, hey. You know, part of what our company does, they may call and do a survey. So we always want to make sure you're aware of the projects or the, the financing options that we have. So just to give you a heads up, we have a couple. Uh, one is a monthly payment option. One is a same as cash. If you like to use other people's money, like some of my customers do, hint, hint, nudge, nudge, you know, maybe you might be in that boat. I know you probably have the money, but heck, why not use someone else's money for two years or a year and a half and invest that money elsewhere? You know, you can bring it up. That's a great way to do it. You know, so just make sure you're bringing it up. That's the key thing. Because if you go in with a high... I also have a question. Okay, go ahead. It's on the previous question. How much are you hoping to invest in this project? Uh huh. What if you ask that question and it's for a huge kitchen that would obviously be more than seven to $10,000? Doesn't matter. And their answer is, oh, I'm hoping to only spend $2,000. You're going to get it. You're going like, to get that response. So you, you're going to get that, again, you're not really here asking these needs assessment questions and immediately addressing that. You're taking notes. So this is telling you, like if you ask me that question, or if I'm sorry, if I asked you that question and you told me what you just said, oh, it's 2000 bucks what I'm hoping to spend. I would say, all right, take a note down. No worries. We're actually going to get to a before and after section here shortly where I'm going to show you some real installations that we've done and you can see what kind of project costs they had. Um, and again, it'll give you some indication. Most of our customers aren't too sure what to expect, you know, so we'll, we'll go over that. Or another thing that I used to do is I would joke with them and say, 
because I worked on my backyard a lot. My uh, when I my previous home that I had, the backyard was horrible. It was like dirt. <laughs> it was nothing. And we had a nice pond in the back, a beautiful view, and all this stuff, but. We didn't really have a good backyard. So I said, you know, when I started my backyard project, I thought I was for sure, I'm done. I'm not spending more than 4,000 bucks. But man, I just had no clue. I had a buddy that had a landscaping company. I assumed I'm going to get a buddy price. Before you know it, I spent 12 grand, you know, and, and I love my backyard. I wouldn't trade it for the world. But man, I just, I had no idea going into it. I, I wasn't an expert in that field. So again, you can approach it a few different ways. I don't think this is the appropriate time to bring anything up other than just no no big deal. Again, we'll go over shortly. We just want to make sure we understand what kind of uh, budget, if you have one already in mind, you know, you have. That way I can help you stay within your budget. You know, I can navigate you through it. And you're going to move on because the next step that you're going to see where we do some picture comparisons, before and afters, you're going to literally show them this is a before, this is an after, this is how much that customer spent. And you're going to plant a number in their head. And it doesn't matter if they said 2000 bucks because they don't know anything. This is their first time. And again, I've had customers before when they like late, late, later on in this presentation, you're going to see the price is right game. It's another way to have them guess what they think the project's going to cost after you've built in all this value and everything. So um, you're going to get a crazy guess every once in a while there too. And I've had someone guess 2000 bucks. And still buy when it was seven thousand bucks. So again, don't don't get beat up too much. Just wear a poker face, move on, and you, you, by the time you're done with your appointment, hopefully you've built up the value and price conditioned enough to where you'll you'll be able to get over that. Okay. Not for addressing right there. So, uh, are there any other projects that you would like me to quote for you today? This is really just designed to see. You know, hey, we do a lot. We do bathrooms, kitchens, uh, we do fireplaces, we can do vanities. So I noticed there's a little half bath vanity right here off the kitchen. Is that something you'd like me to measure while I'm here? Or do you have any other projects you might want me to measure for? You know, and that's really just determining what scope of work we're, we're dealing with. And they may bring up that bathroom or something that you can go and attack and maybe get, uh, get an additional sale. So before we move on, is there any questions about any of this, uh, the, the needs assessment questions? No? No. All right. So we're going to stop share on that one. And then we're going to start share back on the new hire training. So we've gone over our needs assessment. Next, we're going to do the pitch book. Which, again, I would have loved if, uh, if you guys haven't, it doesn't sound like a lot of you have actually been able to download that WeTransfer link that I sent you. But in the WeTransfer link, it actually will show, it, it will have the pitch book. But since we don't, a lot of you guys don't have it, I'm just going to do, I'm going to pull it up real quick and then I'll share screen. This is the new pitch book. Uh, buddy, they're Knoxville. Buddy actually asked me for a rebranded one, I think, which um, I don't have. So I'm gonna have to either find out who has it or uh, or something. But I think these are all branded trend transformations at the moment. Let me screen share. All right, can you guys see the screen now? Yes. All right. So. This is our trend transformation trend transformations pitch book. So again, we're going through. Oh, Mike just texted me saying this could be customized to BGT. I just need to get it to him. So it sounds like a pretty easy fix. But those of you that are uh, trend transformations, grand transformations, it's pretty much the same. I think the branding just changes. So again, we've already looked at this slide here, which is the artistic tradition. It goes over our company information. Green Guard Gold NS NSF 51 certified, which is what the uh, Buford uh, rep was talking about earlier. NSF 51 is just an indication of the ability to use this in a restaurant setting, which in order to be able to use a product in that type of setting, it has to be able to be non-bacteria forming. It's a very important thing to bring up. Bringing up the fact that this is a product that's made in the USA Again, keep in mind, your customer at this point does not know much about our product other than what they perceive from whatever advertisement or home show, whatever whatever's actually been um, planted in their mind on their own. So this is where you have the opportunity to plant 
what you want, the information you want about our company and about this type of process. So we're a global company, locally owned and operated, more than a million projects worldwide, beautiful, unique surfaces to please any palette. Again, in the beginning with you, with all the new sales reps, this is, I would lean heavily on this crutch. Okay, if you want to tweak it down the road and just use this slide or that slide, that's one thing. But in the beginning, I would use this as much as possible until you get your pitch down. So these are just, this part of the pitch book's got some reviews. And again, I would, I would really, this is where I think we can customize it a little bit for local reviews if you have them. But I would definitely push and pull up your Yelp or pull up any reviews you've gotten on Angie's List or however you get your reviews and see what kind of positive local reviews you can share with your customers. I also used to have saved on my iPad um, the local, the Better Business Bureau rating or you know whatever rating system that you want to show, your Yelp reviews, whatever it is. That way you can pull it up right there on the spot. So what, this is what our customers have uh, to say about us. So what's important about your project? Again, you've already covered this a little bit in the needs assessment, but you know this is really a study that's done by Howells in 2014 based on a survey. Most people um, you know, value the improvement and look and feel of the space. Um, they want, you know, 57% of people want to make it more functional. So you're just trying to show them what everybody else out there in the world surveyed, you know, really put down as their, uh, their, their interest. Again, this, this slide here is really a way to, to kind of, if they didn't answer the question, the needs assessment, you, you can have them rank from one to four. Okay. So I'm going to give you four categories here, durability, beauty, ease of maintenance, and lifetime warranty. And I'd like you to put the most important as number one and the least important as number four. So what's the most important, what's the least important? And make them rank it. And then you can continue to take notes. You know, you've already taken started taking notes anyways because you're doing the needs assessment. So just go ahead and write that down. What's my number one, two, three, four? Because that'll give you an indication of what type of person you're dealing with as well. So according to 2014 Howe's Home Survey, um, this is what's the most important thing about the company you choose to do business with. 83% uh, of people that were surveyed said that they had good reviews. 70% uh, of people said that they are an expert in their field. Then 60, the, the person they can work with. And then 53% has completed projects in a style similar to mine. And only 7% of people really chose the just because it's the least expensive option. So you're trying to kind of sow a dialogue here that, hey, Let's not make this all about price because, you know, when is the cheapest thing you've ever bought been the best thing you've ever bought? Never. You know, you've never bought something the cheapest that's been the best. All right. So uh, have you uh, have you done any research about your pro what your project might cost? So this is where your question when you ask them about, hey, what are you wanting to invest in your project? That's why I said, don't worry about it. Even if they say it's 2,000 bucks, you're gonna hit them with the, the, the pitch book next, which is gonna go over studies. And these aren't numbers that we've made up. These, these are numbers that are legit numbers that are, are done by Remodeling Magazine. So these are just kind of a brief explanation of the numbers you're gonna show next. Do you have a question? Were you waving at me? Or no, you were just waving at someone else at the office probably, right? Sorry, yeah. <laughs> That's all right. All right, so. Uh, the cost versus value. So your mid-range kitchen and your upscale kitchen. So this just gives you a definition of what each one is. Not important that I read word for word here. And then if it's a bathroom, same thing. Mid-range bathroom, upscale bathroom, it gives you an actual definition of what those terms mean. Uh, so the customer can kind of see, oh, well, I guess I'm a mid-range kitchen or uh, I'm a upscale kitchen. You know, you, then they can know. So then, I'm sorry, go ahead. I, I forgot we weren't muted. That's right. You want me to? You want me to mute you? <laughs> no, no. I was, I was just going to say one of the things that I used to say is, where do you feel your project falls within this, you know, mid range or upscale? Right. Just to try to get the get them to get some buy in on, you know, get them have an emotional bump, you know, to get them to go from that two thousand to uh, right. I guess my project's more of a mid range. That's yep. all I was going to say. And that's a very astute thing. So maybe, you know, especially those of you in, when you're getting your feet wet, as you're going through this slide and you describe this, you, you, you can read through it and know it word for word. Don't expect your customer to sit there and read through every word. 
you need to look at it, know it, and say, here's an explanation of what a mid-range kitchen is. Here's what an upscale kitchen is. Um, which do you feel like, like Glenn said, you guys are closer to, one or the other? All right, great. So if it's mid-range, now we're on this slide. Mid-range, your bathroom model may cost this. The resale value is this. Your cost recoup is this. And then the same thing for the bathroom remodel, um, you, you know, as kitchens. So you've got all these figures that were already come to get that came together for you. And this is according to a 2017 cost versus value report. So this isn't something we came up with. And that's what I would stress to a customer is show them that little bottom line I highlighted, which is extremely small and I can't see because I don't have my glasses on. You know, it, it says, you know, basically that I believe it's, I think it was cost versus value report, but it was a 2017 study. These are not figures from 2011. This isn't something, again, we create or we created. It's something that someone else independently did. So it gives you the cost. And there's your first plant right there. Okay. So now you've done your very first plan of, okay, a minor kitchen remodel. Your job cost, you know, is generally about 20,000 bucks. And then, maybe 2021 your resale value on that 1617 your cost recouped is about 80 percent so again these are very good figures to use the granite transformation advantage this is where you're going to start to talk about what our company does what we offer and you can say hey you know we've got really three core product lines we've got our trend stone our engineered stone uh, let me tell you what that engineered stone is we are uh, uh, made up of either granite, quartz, marble, chips, uh, porcelain, glass, and recycled glass, and we mix it with a polyester resin, and it's a good flexible resin. So unlike a normal quartz surface where you may get chipping, cracking, breaking, this is something that's flexible and can take a beating. You could drop something on the corner and not necessarily break the product. The resins we use also are more UV resistant, so you don't have to worry about color fading or anything like that. Or they're more heat resistant as well, so you can take something from the oven and put it right on top of the surface. And it's so resilient, you can actually cut right on the product itself. So you don't have to use a cutting board. You can cut right on the surface. So, you, you know, you can start with all that. Back with the lifetime warranty, you know, you're just going to go over your basic elevator pitch, which, again, you guys all have great people to go off of in your local markets. Um, Arkansas there, Dean, he's a monster. He is a machine. Yeah. That guy is just just go shadow and listen to him. You don't have to follow everything he does, but listen to his passion for the product. And, you know, again, take take a little bit of this, a little bit of that, mix it up and make it your own. You know what I mean? Yeah, that's what you really need to do. Uh, down in Knoxville, obviously, Glenn's there all the time. You guys have lots of help there, but understand and know the product, know the benefits, know the elevator pitch, because that's what you need. You need to be able to, to at least, at minimum, understand our products and our benefits so you can sell it to a customer. So comparing products benefits. So this is where, again, we've already talked about this briefly using some of those pictures that I showed you earlier and how we compare an industry from other products that are similar to ours. So you can see here, you know, stone, quartz, slab granite, solid surface, laminate, and tile. And it's okay to let them know and joke around with them saying, hey, yeah, uh, we came up with this. Okay. Haha. Yeah, it's a little self-serving, but we just want to show you in a graph that we actually have more heat resistance than XYZ. And someone just tried to type me a message. Just one second. Let me check. Make sure it's not something we need to type. It's the remodeling website. Oh, perfect. Remodeling website. Thank you for adding that. So the remodeling website is right there at your uh, fingertips. But you've got, again, all of these called out by name, you know, you get to see one, two, three, four, five. So you see this quartz, silestone, zodiac, cambria, whatever it is, you see how we share a lot of properties, okay? And that's why I say it's it's something that you need to get the nuances down on, on where we're different from a quartz, a silestone, or zodiac. You're naturally gonna have a certain number of people that just flat out don't wanna deal with a, a messy demolition. They've had a bad experience, heard of someone having a bad experience and that'll help you. But if that's not a big problem for them, you really need to learn the nuances between us and courts because we do have some advantages and it's silly to go in just trying to pitch it as the same thing. So again, this, this slide is helpful just to kind of give you, uh, give your customers a visual. <clears throat> 
And here's our steps in our process, Mr. And Mrs. Customer. You know, we have three basic steps. We have the design, measure, and cost, which is the step that we're in today. We have a template, which is going to be our final measurement where we're going to do exact measurements of your space. And then we're going to build everything custom to fit your space. And then our installation, where then they're going to come out and do a double check and dry fit. And then they're going to lay down the AB epoxy, install it, and we're going to be in and out in a day or two days, whatever, with very little mess. You don't want to say no mess because it's impossible to have a remodel with zero mess, but we're about as close as you get, you know? where our, our, uh, our crew does a very good job. And then you're just gonna kind of show them a real quick sneak peek. We do cabinet refacing, we do mosaic backsplashes, we do, uh, oh yeah, we, we can customize. Mike wants me to remind you guys that we can customize the pitch book for you. So at any point, if you want us to customize this for your location, it can be done. So your bathrooms, your fireplaces, your countertops, obviously. So these are just some nice slides to kind of spend a second on to make sure they understand the different areas of expertise that we have before you move on to the next step. So does this pitch book make sense to everybody? Does anyone have a question that they want to stop and hover on before we move on to the next step? Good. All right, so we're going to go back to a reminder here on where we're at in our process. Is everyone doing okay to keep going through? Or do we need... Yeah. A Okay, I was gonna say, do we need a five minute or anything? All right, so we now have completed the pitch book. Next, we're moving on to the iPad photos and design concepts. So I'm gonna be running on the assumption that everyone loves my beautiful program and is gonna subscribe to my albums that give you all these pictures, but ultimately it doesn't matter. If you do have photos, that's what's important. You know, if you wanna use local ones that you guys already have maybe preloaded, that's fine too. Uh, but you want to have something up there. So we're going to go back to screen sharing photos. All right, can you guys see the photos now? Yep. All right. So this is where you're going to take that information that you got in your needs assessment. Maybe you asked your customer, uh, okay, so what's our vision of this project? And they said, well, you know, I really I watch a lot of HGTV. I, I watch a lot of this or that or the other, or I'm on, you know, house and I see these awesome, beautiful kitchens that have gray cabinets. I really think that's a neat look. All right, well, let me show you some installations of kitchens that we've done that have gray cabinets. And then boom, you can show them that folder and it shows them some different design concepts of things that we've done. All right, maybe they say, you know, really, I like white cabinets. We've got a cat. I've got a category in here too for white cabinets. It really doesn't matter. You're just going to show them, Hey, some design concepts of this, that, and the other. That's one purpose of these iPad photos. But in my opinion, the most important thing is this folder here, which is the before and afters. And this is where you're going to offer a, um, a real world situation where you can show them Okay, this kitchen is one I used to use all the time. And I know it's a little dated, so just spare me if you guys are looking and you're like, whoa, who does red cabinets anymore? Those things are hideous. But this was a big impact. So for me, I would use this photo and I'd say, all right, Mr. and Mrs. Customer, next I'm going to show you some installations of local jobs that we've done. And uh, it's a good way for you to understand, since this is your first time, what, what goes into these projects and how much they cost. So... I'm gonna show you this this before, and as you can see, we transformed, we did cabinet refacing for this customer, we had backsplash, countertop, we added a few cabinets, did some under cabinet lighting, undermounted sink, and this was the finished product, this was the after. So again, before, after. And then we had a side area that we did for them as well. Here's the before, here's the after. So it was a really nice installation for them. Uh, we did all of this in six days, isn't that amazing? It's crazy that we could transform a kitchen to look so much different and it's so different in five, six days. It's nuts. So this kitchen costs this customer. Now here's where it takes the nuance, okay? So if you're in a customer's house and you can eyeball and see that, wow, this is a big kitchen. I need to be careful here. Because if you say, oh, this kitchen costs $30,000 and theirs costs $35,000, that's a problem. The purpose of this exercise is to plant a number that's realistic for their situation, which you're gonna get better at as time goes on. 
Um, but I used to go in and I knew it like the back of my hand. I could eyeball a kitchen once I understood what the scope of work was going to be. Because again, keep in mind, this is after your needs assessment. So you know what you're going to be quoting out. So now I can go show them a picture like this. And I know, okay, they're going to have us do cabinets, counters, backsplash in this kitchen. So I can show them this before, this after, and say, can you believe this was done in six days? And this only cost that customer $25,000. Now, I'm only telling them that number if I'm in a kitchen that's going to cost 18. All right? Uh, if if I know that kitchen's going to cost 20, I might up it a little bit or 22, I might up it a little bit, you know. If I'm not sure and I just want to err on the side of caution, I'll say this was only 25, 30,000 bucks, whatever you want to use. The number really needs to be altered based on the what type of job you're looking at, but you need to stop after you give that number and look at the customer and see what is their response to that number you just gave. All right, if you just gave a $25,000 number and they look like they keeled over with a heart attack, you need to address it. <laughs> no, well, don't worry. This person did a lot of stuff that you're not gonna probably do, so don't freak out, all right? As you can see from the before, we moved their fridge all the way to the other side of their room. We did uh, you know, glass fronts for their wine area. We did all sorts of stuff that we may not do in your project, so don't worry, okay? Now, you're trying to show them a big number and then reassure them not to worry that, hey, we can design something. That's why I asked that budget question because if I know what your budget is, I can try to navigate this, and in this case, I could have told them, maybe we don't do glass fronts, maybe we don't do under cabinet lighting, maybe we don't do this and that and the other, okay? So with you planting a number and showing them a picture, I'm going to show you another awesome one that we just got. So I'm going to show you a pretty crazy one. Ready? Before, before, after. So you see these before and afters have an insane impact when you're dealing with these clients. So if you can plant a visual, that's number one. That's, that's huge. Because you got to get them to visualize, oh my God, my space could look like this. Look at that crappy old kitchen. Mine look kind of looks like this. And they, theirs looks like that now. That's crazy. So you need to be armed with a number and the right before and after to show them. Okay? Maybe, maybe it's not that. Maybe it's this. Maybe here's your before and here's your after. It's still gorgeous. It's nice. It's just not as crazy as the other ones. And maybe this is one that you keep in your back pocket for, hey, look, this person just had us do cabinet refacing, some under cabinet lighting, they had us redo, and then they had us do the backsplash. Undermounted sink, some plumbing work, new fixture. This one only cost them $19,000 because you know it's going to cost fifteen dollars in their home. You know what I mean? So you're laying that out. But these pictures are extremely powerful. If you don't use pictures, you're really gonna struggle with giving your customer a buy-in. We do have some others um, that you can use before, after, that are a smaller uh, space. And not all of them are cabinets and counters, so we do have some before and after somewhere for that as well. Like I think this is one. <clears throat> before, after. So. Again, I don't like using this one as much because it's not as wow, uh, much of a wow factor. I always like using the wow factor ones, even if they're not going to be considering that, just because I think it's it, it's really going to plant an idea in their mind that, that might benefit you later on. Now, these pictures are also where you're going to help them get a visual. Let's say they answered in the sink area that, well, I have no idea. I didn't even think about a sink. Well, I mean, I can show you what our installation would look like with a top-mounted sink, which is kind of what you have. Now, are they going to like that look? No. <laughs> and that's why you show it, because you're trying to show them, well, why not invest in something undermounted? You know, it's a cleaner look. You know, it, it really does look a little bit nicer, and this is the time that you want to go through and, and do these sort of uh, upgrades. So there's, a, again, a few more sink pictures. So we've got these folders for a purpose. And each one of these folders are gonna, you know, have a different you know, reason why we do it. Let me show you another one here. So our let's see here. The competition one we've already showed you. Oh, let's start 
No, I don't want to go to that one yet. Hold on. Let's go to uh, edging and corners. So let's say you're talking to your clients about your edging and corners. And this is the easiest scapegoat. I, I used to use this all the time with people when um, I would be doing a pitch and they'd say, well, you know, I'd talk about some weaknesses with other products and they'd say, well, what are your weaknesses? This is an easy one to use. That isn't a big deal. You can say, well, we're not perfect. You know, uh, for our products, for instance, we, we aren't able to do some of the fancy edging that others can do, you know, so that would be a perceived weakness of ours. We only really have two different types of edges that you could choose from, or some do more than that, it, depending on your franchise, your location. But I would say this is kind of an idea of what our edges look like. We have a beveled edge, which is nice. It's three pieces joined together, a little bit more expensive because it's more labor intensive. You got more pieces you're dealing with, and then you've got a straight Euro edge, um, which is the uh, black one that I showed you just a second ago. There you go, which is a black, you know, the black countertop with a straight edge. That's a clean edge. It's what a lot of people prefer. It's a little bit less expensive because you don't have as, as much assembly work to be done. So, you know, you've got a few options there. But if I had to pick a weakness, that's one of ours. You know, we don't, what's another one would be, you know, again, if you're wanting a fossilized crystal in the middle of your, your countertop, obviously that's not something that we can offer you. You know, if you were to get some rare piece of stone, you might be able to find some piece of petrified wood fossilized in there. It's, they can get some beautiful stuff that we just can't do. So again, these pictures here are extremely uh, good to use. If they start asking questions about like seams, for instance, this is where you can really illustrate the importance of having a lightweight material at your seams. So if you notice here, you see what's going on on the seam with the countertop, it's shifted. But well, why did it shift? Well, because a piece of stone is 30 to, you know, 25 to 35 pounds per square foot. It's very heavy. Ours is 2.87 pounds per square foot. So do you think we're going to have shifting in seams like this? No. So again, yet another benefit to showing that. Um, now, I do actually have a category of our product being seamed. It's important that you don't, you, you, in, you tell your customers, look, there's no such thing as an invisible seam. We get close, but you, you're still going to be able to see the seam. You know, this is a product of ours that hides a seam really well. This is a color, but you can still, if you look closely, you can see that there's a seam right here. So if that comes up in conversation, you've got a few pictures that you're, you're armed with to show them how tight the seam is. And if they start to bellyache about how, oh, well, you can still see the seam, you can show them an old competitor seam and say, well, it's not, I mean, it could be worse. <laughs> Look, you use a slab of granite or quartz, eh, yeah, it's, they can't usually get it as tight as we can. So we get it as close to invisible as possible. And again, this would be the, the appropriate time to really, if they've told you, hey, we're looking at quartz as well, then that's where you pull out this competition folder and you say, you know, Quartz is a great product. Uh, I'm not going to sit here and say that it's a horrible product. It's got a lot of similarity stars, but I want you to understand the differences between our products. And then you show these. One is the UV ray difference between one and the other. Ours will be more protected against that. The quartz will have more uh, tendency to chip out like this or have you know some sort of fracture in the, the slab because of heat. You know, there's Heat shock is a real thing. Or if you're up against granite, you you know, I showed all these to you earlier, so I'm not going to double back through all of them, but you can show them repair jobs on quartz countertops, whatever you feel like will fit that moment and what they're looking at. So you've now, hope, does anyone have questions, by the way, about these pictures? Have a, are, are you curious about if there are any specific looks or anything like that? Any suggestions on things that you would add for the folks that aren't new? I think uh, I think everybody's unmuted too, so you guys sound like you're good. Uh, backsplash options. I do want to spend a second on that. So I do not have a lot of surfaces photos here, and that is uh, by design. Again, in the beginning when we talked about what products we make, I listed how many? <laughs> Three. Three. So you're gonna see we showcase what we make. All right. Um, you do have you, you have p potential for other options out there. 
I sold a ton of trend glass, all right? And this was back in the days when we had no option of selling outside product. We didn't have surfaces at our disposal. Um, I do want to stress that I feel like there's in any market, I don't care the market because I was in Columbus, Ohio. It was not in Miami or New York or uh, you, you know any of these places where it's super posh and they, they just they can't get enough glass. <laughs> it was a, a market where you know you had to sell a little bit. And again, I told the rich history and story of our company. I, I really explained it in a way that made them feel like, hey, do you really want that cheap Chinese junk that is at Home Depot or Lowe's that, you know, you and Joe and Sally and Beverly next door, they're all going to have the same backsplash? Or do you want something that's a little more unique and one of a kind? And again, that's where I really spent, you know, some time showing them different backsplash options. So some of the newer backsplash options that you can see, man, is Kelly frozen? Kelly, are you there? No, I'm here. Oh, sorry. I thought you were frozen. Um, you, you can I'm show them some. <laughs> I got gotcha. you. You got some pretty gorgeous photos of backsplash. Use them at your just you know use them to help sell product. You know, really, we've got amazing, beautiful backsplash options that are not normal. They're not common. You're not going to see them everywhere. So mm -hmm. take some time. Look through your photos, whether they be mine or the ones that are provided to you by your local franchise and really get familiar with why would I want the, the crap at Home Depot or Lowe's? I can get something way more unique and I'm dealing with the manufacturer right here. You know, that's where your customer's head should be at. Not, oh, right. well, I just want a white subway because I've seen it a thousand times. No? So uh, anyways, these photos, you can see there's tons of categories. I'm not gonna go every single one. Uh, but there should be a scenario for every situation if your customers have an appliance garage. That's actually a pretty unique selling proposition for you because uh, Glenn could probably answer this question. Glenn, are you still there? Yes. Okay. So, Glenn, if they have an appliance garage that's all one big cabinet, do you see any way that you might be able to pitch that as a benefit for us? Well, yeah, we're going to be able to still install our product without having to remove all the cabinets because anything else is going to have to go underneath there. So we're going to be able to, you know, get around that, put the seam right where the door shuts. Yep. So that way, so that way you know, that's a huge advantage. Bingo. So you can sometimes get people, especially if they're sensitive about not wanting to tear up anything or do any major construction to their, their space. If they've got a big cabinet that goes all the way down to their, ca their countertop on the top, then odds are they're going to have to remove that whole section of cabinets just to get the countertop out for them to put in a new surface. And then you're betting that they're going to be able to get that surface back to the thickness it needs to be so they can set those cabinets back in and have it sit flush without doing some ugly trim piece down at the bottom. So we have the ability to not remove any of the cabinets and we can simply install by seaming here at the door and seaming on the back there is how we used to do it. So we'd seam once in the back here and then once at behind, just behind the door. Correct. So that's why people ask me sometimes, why the heck are you putting appliance garages on pictures? And that's why, because you want to show a customer and illustrate to them why we're superior in that particular area. So again, I could spend hours going over these, but these are just installation photos. We have tons and tons and tons and tons of them. So feel free to, uh, again, send me an email if you'd like to be added to this list, and I'll be sure to send you the invites. And I have a YouTube tutorial as well uh, to go over um, how to put them in. Now, Trishinda is the last thing I want to spend time on here just because it is a different product. So those of you that are new to our company, which is you know a lot of you, not all of you are doing ongoing education, we have a, a line called Trishinda. And Trishinda is our marble look, our Portland silver. It's a very good seller for us. Um, it is a printed technology. So it's something that we're actually applying a print to. So we're taking our normal slabs of um, our engineered stone, and then we're applying an image and heating it up to the point where it actually embeds. We originally called it tattoo because it's kind of the same idea. It's embedding into the slab itself. 
uh, the ink into, it's penetrating into the slab. So that's where you're gonna find our marble looks uh, that are so popular right now. Um, we've got some that look like Portland silver, like concrete type of look. Like here's one that's Portland white. That looks nice. And then we've got, of course, the veined looks as well. So you can see the veined looks. All things I would have absolutely killed for when I was selling because this was a big problem. <laughs> we couldn't, we couldn't, ha we didn't have anything to offer that wasn't a speckly countertop. It was, it was all speckly. Uh, now you've got some gorgeous options to choose from uh, that that are veined, and you can run up the wall, and they just look outstanding. So really, really um, excited that you guys have that to offer now because it was a big problem for us. We sometimes got escorted right back out of the house because we didn't have anything that had veins running through it so now you've got that and that's good <clears throat> so that's the last picture i wanted to share with you guys um any any questions before we move on to our next block do you guys want to take 10 minutes or anything just to get up and stretch your legs no, look at okay. that kelly's good she's like sure. good keep going <laughs> All right, so I'm gonna go back to our new hire training agenda. So uh, measuring and calculations. As I discussed earlier, measuring and calculations should be done quickly. Um, I used to set out, and after I'd gone over pictures with my clients and initial design concepts, I spent some time going over and uh, basically just telling them, you know, hey, Based on our conversation and the pictures I've showed you, what you responded to that you like, I have some initial recommendations that I can make for you. I'll pull those out. While I pull those out, I'd like you to then kind of make sure that I'm good in my guess and you narrow down to your favorite two or three maybe from the collection that I'm setting out. And while you're doing that, I'm actually, and you can also use my iPad to look at pictures. I used to offer that too. Um, but I would say, uh, while you're doing that, I'm going to actually go knock out your measurements. It should only take me a couple of moments. So go ahead and, and uh, take a look at the initial thoughts that I have based on our conversation. And um, you can narrow down and just get rid of the ones that you don't like. Once you get down to your favorite two or three, after I'm done measuring, I'll go out and grab bigger pieces in my car. So I used to keep a 12 by 12 and a little 3 by 6 of every single color that we offered. In my car my car looked like this the trunk was like <laughs> was bad it was it was uh it was definitely rough on my shocks but it, it was something that i felt like i needed because my selling advantage to my client was look don't go to a slab yard you're going to look at something outside that is going to look totally different than when you take it inside all they're going to do is break off a little piece which i find hilarious that they just crack off a piece of granite showing you how fragile it is but they'll hand you a piece of stone to take home and you're gonna guess off this little piece. For me, I think it's important to see from small to large, how does this look? Do I like it more? Do I like it less? So while I'm doing the measurements, go ahead and narrow down to your favorite few. And while you do that, I'll get that knocked out. Once I'm done, we'll finish by looking at bigger pieces and coming down to your final design concept and your collect what selection you're, you're gonna make, okay? So then you're measuring, and this should take you, as I said, five minutes. Glenn, what would you say is your average time of measuring a kitchen? Uh, you know, a standard size kitchen would take about, you know, 10 minutes, 15 tops. Yeah. So I'm not saying be sloppy with your measurement. I You want to be accurate. But I'm saying that if you take 20 to 25 minutes to measure something, that's an issue. You, you need to, because that's going to be a big, it's not going to take them that long to look through your iPad, and then it's not going to take them that long to get down to their favorite color, and then guess what they're doing? They've left your, you no longer have their attention. They have their attention elsewhere on this or that and the other, and so you, you now lost your audience. So it's important you keep that interaction going, and you measure out. Now, just food for thought, if you start to hear as you're measuring that they're over the over heel, you know, they're in love with a specific color. Let's say it's just for the sake of argument, white star, which is one of our colors. You know, that's where I used to start planting a seed of what, what's to come here, which is your urgency. I would say, oh, actually, uh, we're about to do a commercial job in that. That's a gorgeous color. It looks great. If I could tell that they were already honed in on white star 
and they just that was clearly their favorite color, I would start with that planting a seed of, hey, actually, we're doing a commercial job in that, and it's gorgeous. You know, and that is a setup for later. So just notate that I said that, all right? So as you're going on to the next step, which is getting them down to one color, you're going to bring back in the big pieces, hopefully, of the three finalists or two finalists. And then you're going to sit there and be Vanna White. You're going to be like the optometrist. One or two, one or two. You're going to hold it up against their cabinets. Or if they're changing cabinets, you're going to bring that color in and say, okay, which one do we like better, this or this? And you're going to get them down to one. And now let's say you get them to two and it's difficult for you to get them to buy into one. That's when it's going to come down to, look, all right, you've got two colors that you're down to. Can you honestly tell me right now that you would love both of these equally? If the price was exactly the same, you wouldn't be able to pick, correct? All right, so that said, as I told you, White Star, we're going to do a commercial project on. So I can probably get you a better price on White Star. So if you love both equally, let's do the one that's less expensive. And you're not going to get an argument out of that too often. Okay, they, they don't want to spend more than they have to. So it's one that, again, your job as a sales rep is to help them navigate through this difficult you know, decision-making process and get them to land on one color, no more, one, okay? So you, you want to narrow it down, spend as much time as you need to to get them down to that one color. Have them walk out of the room, <laughs> come back in. I did that a couple times. I'm like, all right, so we got two colors. Walk out of the room and walk back in and tell me which one pops at you more. You know, I used to do all sorts of different things just to get them to, okay, that's the color. That's the one. But hopefully it won't take that much. It'll just, you know, be natural and they'll go to one. So the urgency close setup. Glenn and I are on the same page with the one call close. I'm sure we have a, a different strategy on how we get, get that going. Uh, my approach, I was not a huge... Um, I wasn't very, I was pushy, but I wanted all the pressure for the customer to be internal. All right. And what that means is, you know, well, actually I'll ask you, Kelly. So Kelly, have you ever been to a mall and had someone at the kiosk in the middle of the aisle coming out to push a perfume, a massage, whatever it is? Oh yeah. Does that make you comfortable or uncomfortable? No, I usually walk away. <laughs> okay. So for me, I'm the same way. So in a sales process, I desperately looked for a way to get away from that feeling. I didn't want my customer to have that feeling in the end. When I showed them the price and I, I wanted them to have a reason to buy, but I didn't want to be pushy. So the way that I did that was I came up with these scenarios, all right? And these scenarios were, look, I'm going to make it easier for my customer to make their decision by giving them some urgency. So what I would say is, I would say, hey, you know that white star color that we picked that was your final color? I don't know if you remember me mentioning it when I was measuring, but uh, we actually are going to do a commercial job in that project. So what that means for you is we're going to be buying it in a bulk rate or a, you know, a cheaper discounted rate because just like when you buy water at Costco or Sam's Club, it's cheaper when you buy in bulk. It's no different for us. If we buy 50 slabs at once, it's cheaper. So you actually have a unique opportunity here where we can actually, if we haven't already ordered, which I'm not sure of, I'm going to need to make a call real quick, I, we might be able to get you onto that commercial project and you'll just buy the slabs at the lower rate that we're going to be getting for that that project which will be nice for you it'll drop your project cost but again i need to confirm so just one moment let me go run in and uh and give my owner or business partner a call if you're i don't think anyone on this call is an owner so it would just be let me call my owner and this is well actually i'm sorry <laughs> phoenix you got an owner right there but you're not running sales calls i don't think sorry <laughs> you're not running sales calls though i don't think if you are then yeah say business partner but otherwise, you want to try and make a call to your owner. So I would then call. I actually called my owner. 90% <clears throat> of the time, he wouldn't talk to me because he knew exactly what I was doing. <laughs> so he would just pick up the phone and let me ramble for like five minutes, knowing that I had done it a thousand times before. So I would do exactly this. I would pick up the phone and say, 
Hey, John, that was the name of the owner of our franchise. Hey, John, I've got a customer here that picked White Star. I'm not sure if we've already ordered for or not, but they know that White Star is the color for them, and I'd like to try and add their slabs on to that project. Um, as long as it's not already ordered, you know, because obviously it'll drop the price a little bit for them. So is there any way that we could add on three slabs to that order or two slabs to that order? He would inevitably not answer me and I would say, oh, great, we can. <laughs> awesome. We can, we can group you up. That's fantastic. And then I would hang up the phone and then good news, Mr. And Mrs. Customer, we haven't ordered it yet. So let me explain how that would work. So, you know, you want a lower price on your project, which I'm assuming that you do. We'll go ahead and order your slabs along with that commercial project. And that'll make sure that we can buy your slabs a little bit cheaper, which will make your project cost a little lower. And again, really all that's doing is trying to help you with your budget, making sure that the cost stays lower. Other than that, there's no connection between you and this other job. You don't have to schedule at the same time. We'll just order them all at once and get them in the, in the warehouse. That way... You know, when it comes time for your project, we'll have those slabs allocated already, you know, blah, 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 blah. So you're essentially trying to set up a scenario where, oh, man, I want a, I want a cheaper price. And they should have already ordered this job. They haven't. And, you know, there's a reason to act. There's a call to action. But it's not me pushing them saying, buy from me today. Buy from me today. Buy from me today. And I'll give you this. It's me just setting up a scenario and then I'm asking for, okay, so would you like me to price your project at this lower cost or the higher cost? Your percentage of people that are going to say they want a higher cost is, I mean, 1%, 2%. Normally, you're going to get someone that's going to say, yeah, I want the cheaper cost. Okay, great. So that's what you're going to do. You're going to work up their cost based on that bulk rate, okay, or that commercial price. But there are variations of this if you feel more comfortable by saying, Oh, well, actually, we have two extra slabs in stock. We might be able to get you a discount on those. These are all, okay, this is where people, this is why I said it's controversial, okay? Because some people are like, well, that's not being 100% honest. Okay, but it's as honest as your customers being with you saying you're the first of three bids. You know, it's all kind of a little bit of a nuanced dance. You're just really trying to help them negotiate uh, their decision-making process a little bit easier and make it an easier decision for them to move forward. Now, in reality, your owners are likely buying, they buy oftentimes in bulk. That's not a made-up thing. They do buy, they can buy crate packs and get discounts. That's true. You also uh, do occasionally get these slab utilizations if they're not doing, if they do their fabrication in-house, oftentimes they are trying to join jobs together to try and utilize as many slabs as possible and not waste. So you've got some some truth in bringing that up. And for me, I felt more comfortable in not being pushy pushy and saying you got to buy from me today because this this discount's only good today. I didn't want to bring it out like that. I preferred to just bring up a scenario and have them say yes, please price it at the lower price, and then you know they could read between the lines and it, you'd be shocked. Again, we're going to cover the next steps in the process, which helps solidify that. Does this land with everybody? Is that making sense? Because I do get, sometimes people are like, well, wait, well, um, so you, what commercial project are you doing? And they don't get that. This is kind of a made up scenario for the purposes of, of helping create an urgency. Okay. Now you don't have to use that. You guys can come up with your own creative thing. But that worked for me, and I know that works because I used it for years. You know, my close rates were always high. Glenn, you you want to you want to try and come up with a? Did you have any other scenarios that you use? Well, I used I used bundling as well because you know we always we have to order a minimum of sheets of ten, so we have to do ten sheet orders. So you know, I'd like to, you know my one of my things was I'd like to you know we're getting ready to place an order. I'd like to be able to get this on the order. I can, you know, save you a little bit of money on the material. Or, you know, I was one of the old timers with the one call close where I would create a sense of urgency by offering them a discount. And then I'd always say only 75%, only 70% of my customers take advantage of this while I'm in the home today, but it's totally up to you. Yeah. So there's different so, ways. Yeah, feel out your style. Um, try out some things. You guys, like I said, especially Kelly, you, Dean, is an amazing closer. I mean, insane closer. That guy's numbers, when he was telling me his numbers, I was like, 
He's right. got to be. He's full of it. He didn't close that much. And then I looked at his numbers, and I'm like, holy crap! He's he's closing like, I mean, he's closing some deals. I walk around or travel around with him for a day or two and figure that out because he's really he's really skilled. But, I'm doing that this week. <laughs> good, good, very good. Now, um, so when you recap and price is right, extracting budget. Let's cover that for a second. So. If I'm recapping, this is what it sounds like. It sounds like, okay, so just before we go over the pricing, I just wanna make sure I've got everything down. So you're gonna have us do cabinets, and it's this color, this style. You were gonna have us do backsplash, and this is what we selected. Uh, we've got this, that, and the other. And then you get down to countertop color, and we're 100% sure this is White Star. This is our color, right? The one that we're gonna do the commercial rate on. This is it? Yeah. All right, perfect, great. So that's our color. Now, um, let me explain to you now that I understand the scope of work, how this would work again just one more time. So we'll order you with this commercial project, that way you'll get a lower price on your slab. And again, all you have to do is, uh, again, deposit so you can get your slabs ordered. Once it comes in, again, you can still install whenever it's convenient for you. As I said before, not a big deal. You don't have to do the same day or same week as that project is totally unrelated. It's just to get material there and get material cheaper. Now, uh, we're going to do your vanity. We're going to do this. We're going to do that. You're recapping the scope of work. So now we're going to have some fun here in a second. I'm going to actually have you guess how much you think this is going to go. If you get within a dollar or two dollars, I'll pay for your kitchen. You know, so you're going to try to break the ice, get them to guess, whatever. You're going to want to direct this to the driver. So let's say you've got two people there. Usually it's the wife that's the driver of the project that loves it. You're going to you're gonna just simply ask them, okay, before I unveil price, we're going to play a little game. I think that you're probably better at guessing than he is, so I'm going to start with you. Do you guess, what, what's your guess? How much do you think this is going to cost you? da 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 All right, so you're, you're, you're listing off all the stuff you're going to do. You're reminding them that they're getting a bulk rate, and then you're having them guess what, what the cost is going to be. All right? Now, once the wife asks, you can play on, or I'm sorry, wife answers, you can play on that with the husband. Do you think she's right, or do you think she's way off? Do you think she's high, low? He's going to guess low, guys. He's going to guess ridiculously low if you get him to participate. He's going to guess something ridiculous. So let's say it's a $15,000 kitchen. She may guess 12. He's going to guess like five. And that's okay. And that's all just a game to try and extract what job have I done at building value? What job have I done at, you know, make, planting a number in their head? Because you remember, you remember way back when, when we were looking at the before and afters, you know, you've already given them a number. You've done the pitch book and you've given them a number. You've shown them real world scenarios and how much it costs and all that stuff. So you're hoping that that landed and you're hoping through your process and selling the product, you've actually built up enough value to justify that expense. So now when you're asking them to guess before you reveal price, you, that's really the testament to how close have you gotten. And if you ask the driver on the project, they're gonna be giving you a more genuine answer and they usually are gonna offer you up their real budget or at least the value that you've been able to build during the presentation, okay? So don't ask the anyone but the driver first. I actually talked to uh, the Miami franchise last week or the week before, and they do the Price is Right game every time, but he, he kept saying, oh, well, I keep asking, and they keep giving me ridiculous answers, and I said, well, Carlos, or I think it was Carlos, I can't remember who it was, but I said, uh, you know, who are you asking first? Who's answering? And it was clear he was not asking the driver. So I'm like, well, I would rather not have anyone answer than the wrong person answer. Ask the driver. The one who wants the project is who you really want to play this game. All right? Because you know the other one's going to be a way off guess. So when you've guessed that, or when you've gotten to guess or participate, then that's when you're going to, before you reveal price, you can say, oh, well, you're so close. All right, so before I give you price, I just want to ask one question. Other than the price, is there any reason at all why you wouldn't want to do business with our company? You feel comfortable and confident in you know, our how we do it, the colors we've picked. Is there any reason other than price that you would not want to move forward to do business with us? 
and you don't give them that price until they say yes. You know, because we know price is the only thing. All right, well, your guess was off a little bit. Here's actually your price. I've broken it down here, here, here. Hopefully, they guessed high, and it's a little lower, and then boom, they feel good. If it's off a little bit, and it's a little bit higher, sometimes that'll work too, but at least you've initiated a dialogue, and that'll help during negotiation. Now, when I present price, I know that there's a difference in opinion on how to do that. Glenn, did you guys use a quote sheet? What did you use to present price? Uh, we just used uh, a basically a quote sheet. You know, just uh, it was really just a blank, really a blank piece of paper with limited information on it. Yeah. So the thing that the the big takeaway that is across the board, you should not be presenting something that tells the exact square footage. You should not be presenting something that that. Uh, gives too much information basically you just want to provide a cost of your project now when I wrote down my number we actually used to write it out on the agreement because we we're assuming the sale so we already wrote the, the number on the agreement and then we'd completely fill it out whenever we got the sale but I would very clearly write in big letters not a 30-day quote okay and the reason I did that is I would, as I presented price, say, well, your guess was pretty close. It was off a little bit, but it was pretty close. Now, normally we give a 30-day quote. So let me explain to you first what this big not a 30-day quote is down here. You recall we actually did uh, the commercial rate for you, the bulk rate. Well, that's, you know, it's a little cheaper, but there's a reason it's cheaper, and it's because we're buying it in bulk. So Normally, if we just gave you a 30-day rate, you could call me at any time within the month and say, I'm ready to move forward, and then we'd be good. But in this situation, because we gave you the, the special pricing for the commercial rate, you know that's because we're ordering and we're getting ready to order that project tomorrow, next week, doesn't matter. Or Actually, I would say tomorrow. Say, we should have ordered it last week, but we didn't order it. You know. So then you're making it very clear, this is not a 30-day price. Here's the cost. And again... Our steps are you'll have a deposit, which, as I said before, will lock your price in and order the slabs. Next, we'll, uh, your payment will come at template whenever we do the final measurements and we start cutting everything to your specific dimensions. And then the final payment is when we complete your project. So it's a one, two, three step. Okay. First step is just locking in your price, making sure that commercial rate doesn't change. We'll order it all at once. We'll be good. Deposit second. Uh, is that template and then third is when we complete when we complete the job now You the price presentation Glenn did I miss anything that you normally do there? Um, when I for me when I present the price I really don't talk too much after that. Oh, yeah, just, so you're, you're literally You know there are I I get that's a sales strategy that a lot of people do and are very successful with too is they the first person that talks loses? That that's the old the adage, right? The the salespeople I've heard it in a million conferences, books, you name it. That's the thing. You talk first, you lose. And it, it's funny. I actually had a guy that was like a sales guru. I don't even remember what he sold, but I was at his house. I laid down his uh, his price. I did my normal tactics, which are a little different. I do lay down price and I kind of explain the process one more time because of the scenarios, the bulk rate, all that stuff. And the guy literally sat there and gave me sales training as he was signing his contract and giving me a deposit check. <laughs> it was like, you know, you should never talk after you give price because the first person to talk loses. So you, you talked and you lost. And I'm like, okay. So I'll, uh, know, that deposit. I had a guy tell me I was a weak closer one time as he was writing me a fifty percent deposit. That's basically what he was saying. He was like, "Oh, what are you doing? You don't even know what you're doing in sales." I'm like, "I just sold you, though. <laughs> like just, you're giving just, me a check. I just sold you a fourteen thousand dollar project. Right. But, oh, yeah, I'm a weak. I'm weak. I'm, I'm a weak. horrible closer. You're right. But you're just gonna be gracious and talk about. Oh man, you're right. I could learn so much from you. So uh, make that check out to Granite Transformations and. <laughs> but and what, what I mean by not talk, I'm not saying just give awkward dead silence. But I don't try to reclose it once I get. Oh God, no! Really, yeah, I've really, I've really done all my explanation. Yeah, got a more. Um, I've done the the prices right game. Yep. a little bit. Um, you know, we've we've got to clear the prices out in front of them. Now mm -hmm. I let them digest, and right. then you know, 
uh, that have gone to the porch light close where I've given them a little time to yep. to discuss it amongst themselves. But yeah, um, so I, hey, Glenn's right on the money, and people do not. If you you've missed your the train has left the station at this point for selling. So if you set, set your price down and done whatever step you're going to use, uh, once you've set down price, you've lost your opportunity to try and build value, to set a price expectation, to explain why ours is better than theirs. All of that's out the window. That's why you ask that question before you present price, which is other than price. Is there any reason why you wouldn't want to move forward with our company today? And if you don't ask that question, you're leaving all sorts of things up in the air. And then if you offer price and list, but yeah, but you guys, uh, you know, you, you don't have anything that looks like this. You haven't hit the main objection. That's why you ask the question. Other than price, is there any reason why we, you wouldn't feel comfortable in moving forward with our company today? Or just moving forward with our company if you don't want to be that strongly worded by saying today. So if you're presenting price, you've laid it down, you've got that big not a 30-day quote and explain that you need a deposit, you need the next deposit at template, next payment on completion. Then you're going to do, I did porch light almost every time. I don't know about Glenn, but I did a porch light nearly every time. The only time you don't do a porch light, in my opinion, is if you've got a single buyer uh, because it's kind of pointless at that at that point, you know, if you got one person there, because the porch light really is designed to get you out of their space for a moment because they need to talk, and they don't want to talk with you standing over them. They're more likely to tell you, "Oh, well, uh, okay, we'll get back to you," because they're just looking for a little time to talk to each other without you in front of their face. So that porch light, that's what that is: is you're actually leaving the room. Let's say, Kelly, I just dropped $15,000 quote on you for your project, and you and your husband or you know wife, whatever, I don't know your, your orientation, but let's say that you and your significant other want to, you, you know, you, you're pretty sure that your, your significant other is on board, but you're not sure, right? So do you really want to discuss that with me, the salesperson standing right over your head? No. So I'm going to politely excuse myself for a moment as a salesperson and say, give me just one moment. I'm going to run out to my car to see if I've got any card. You can make up whatever you want. I need to go outside to see if I've got an extra sample or I just need to put my bag away, whatever it is. And you're going to leave the house, give them a few minutes, play a few Candy Crush boards, get caught up here. Come on. You know you're behind in the Candy Crush anyway, so you might as well try and catch up with a board or two. But once you actually get back in the home, that's when I can say, okay, so again, as we discussed, the deposit will get us locked into our, uh, our project cost. Then, you know, we'll go ahead and order that up for you. So what do you think? Are we good enough to do your kitchen here? I used to have people, uh, when I shadowed them and trained them, they'd laugh at me when I said that. They'd be like, God, you asked like... Like, what are they supposed to say to that? No, you, you're not good enough to do my kitchen. <laughs> but it worked. It was just my thing. I just, it was an impulse. I went back in. I'm like, all right. So as I discussed, we 10% deposit. We'll get you the, the bulk rate and keep your cost down. So are we good enough to do your project for you or what? I always had a jokey rapport with my customers anyways. And then you're going to get a definite one of two answers. Either they're going to reach for their checkbook or hopefully they grab their checkbook while you're out porch lighting and they're starting to fill it out. Or they're going to come out with uh, a couple of responses. Glenn, what would you say the most common response is to uh, if they're going to if they're telling you no? <clears throat> I got to think about it. Oh, there it is. That's the number one response you're going to hear, folks. Whenever you actually talk to a client and try to present them, even with this, even if you've acknowledged and they see, oh yeah, I need to buy this today because it's going to be a bulk rate, whatever tactic you're using. They could agree to that 100% of the time, and still, you're going to hear that more than anything else. Okay, well, I need to think about it, so we'll be back in touch. And if you turn and run at that point, you're done. You don't have a chance. You don't have a chance at selling them, most likely. I mean, my callback rate, either I sucked, which I didn't suck, or you know, my callback rate was very low. And most of the yeah. system-wide, it's very low because... Your best opportunity to close them is when you're there with them. You've got a captive audience. They're 100% in the moment. Everything's fresh in their mind. 
the scenarios are all fresh in their mind. So what on God's green earth leads you to believe that they're going to call you back in a week or two? It's just not going to happen. Now, they're going to do their best to sell. One of the two things is going to happen. They're going to sell you on why they can't move forward. Or you're going to try your darndest to sell them and figure out a way to make it happen. Because if they say, I have to think about it, almost all the time, I would say a lot of the time, it's your, your price is probably off a little bit or, or whatever. Hopefully, that's what it is. Because you've nailed every other objection. You've already asked them, other than price, is there any reason why we wouldn't move forward today? So if you're not moving forward... Obviously, it's price. So then you can just open up the conversation. And that's where we get into negotiation, all right? So the negotiation is going to start with, well, I mean, we did the prices right game. You don't have to call it that. You can just say, well, you guessed that your project total was going to be 10000 and I just handed you something that said it was 14000 Would it be safe to assume that the reason we're not moving ahead is that you know, we, we've got a difference of $4,000 between our two numbers. Is that safe to say? And if they're not responding, just look. The most common problem I have when people say I have to think about it is, or the most common response I get is, I need to think about it. And 99% of the time, that just means the price is off. So rather than part ways right here and just never talk to you again, which of course they're going to try and convince you. They're going to, oh, no, 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 I'm going to call you tomorrow or next week or whatever. You can say, rather than just part ways right here after all the work we've done designing your kitchen, I'd rather just open an honest discussion of ways that we can make this happen. Let's turn it from a red light to a green light. So let's just talk. Is that what's how, that's, that's what's holding us back is price, I'd assume, right? And then you're going to go into a number of steps. Now, the steps, in my opinion, are always starting with, okay, so you have this, this, and this that we can trim out which they're not going to want to cut anything out. But you start there by saying, well, maybe we could eliminate that edge. Do we do a straight edge instead of a beveled edge? Would that, would that be a deal killer for you? Because we could help you with some costs there. And then you're going to try to see what is expendable, if anything. All right. Now, this is honestly going to be tough because you, you're... You're, as a salesperson, you need to be relying on your read on the situation, and you need to build in a little bit of padding for you to negotiate, if possible, with your customer. Now, different locations have different guidelines on whether they want you to negotiate or they don't, so I'm not going to speak for every franchise owner. You need to defer and talk to your franchise owner about what they're comfortable with you doing. Maybe they have a very straightforward, straightforward pricing um scenario but i would guarantee you if you call your owner and you say i've got a customer that says they're willing to move forward uh i was at 14 they were at 10 but we met in the middle and we're at 12 would you be are you open to taking that project here's what we're going to do scope of work you can pay me less if you need to on commission but i i need to you know i want to close this sale and at least offer it up before i say no that's what you need to do you need to try everything in your power to get that sale now, you're going to realize something. There are some skilled negotiators out there that you're dealing with with customers, and, and they'll, they'll work you if you don't know what you're doing. So <laughs> I can teach a whole class on negotiation specifically, but really the gist of the most successful strategy is to get the jumping off point. I would always start by telling people, Hey, listen, um, I did a similar kitchen to yours, not the same. They didn't have the bulk rate or anything, but I know that we did one two weeks ago and it was about the same size. And I know you guessed 10 and I was at 14, but I think we did that one for like 12.8 or 12.9. I'm not promising that we can get to that number, but would you come up a little bit if we can come down a little bit? And is that something that's more doable for you if we were at close to 13 instead of, you know, 14? It's a lot of savings. Do you think you'd be open to that? All right, well, uh, let me make sure you go over the scope of work again, and then you call that owner again, and, and you, you have the conversation. Say, hey, this customer is ready to move forward, but we need to work a little bit on price. Here's what we're doing. We're doing this color, this edge, this cabinet, whatever it is. This is how many openings. This is the scope of work for the job. And this is what they're willing to move forward with. If we can get down to this price, they're go. They're green lit. They're ready to sign on the dotted line. Give me a deposit check, whatever you want to say. But you need to make it clear while you're on the phone and they can hear you 
that if you get to this price, you're good to go. And before you make the call, you need to make sure and confirm with them. So if I call my owner and I get this price, we're in good shape. We're green, we're green light, not a red light, right? We're good to move forward. Okay, I'll make the call. So again, there's a lot of nuance to it. Glenn, is there anything that you want to add to the negotiation section? Um, I think you did everything. I mean, everything that I would do. The only thing is, when you're doing the bundling and the commercial package, you're almost. So, I mean, how much you've already told them that this is the cheapest or the least expensive route to go. Great point. That actually is one that I used to my advantage. To you know, I used the the generic look. Well, you you just guessed and the price was this instead of this, or you just told me that the price is the only thing that would hold you back from moving forward with us today. But I also used my bulk rate scenario all the time. I would say, listen, folks, I already told you. You know, we're buying these slabs as cheap as we're ever going to get them. So I know that if we leave today and we don't move forward or if I don't, we can't figure something out, we're never going to have a chance to do in your kitchen. It's going to be more expensive because we're, yeah. you know, we're already buying it cheaper than we can normally get it. So let's just have an open discussion about what it's going to take to make this a green light. That's literally right. the tactic I would use. Uh, and again, since I use the bulk rate every time, it was an easy jump into negotiation because I just simply tell them, look, you already understand there's just this is the cheapest we're ever going to get i hate that i don't usually like doing this but i used to play that role all the time yeah i used to negotiate you know like do a negative you know take something away well you know we can get you meet you halfway let's get rid of that beveled edge how important is the beveled edge maybe maybe we don't go with an undermounted sink and then negotiate negotiate those items down as well but, yeah you know, and, or as a or as you know hey we can uh, why don't we go ahead and just do that bevel? For, we'll just throw in the bevel today and you know, let's just right. forward. And I always chambered a little thing in my holster <laughs> for a beveled edge, straight edge, in the last second if I had to push them off of a beveled edge to reduce cost. I would tell them, you know, look, when you go to sell this house in 10 years, people are going to look at your kitchen and be in awe. It's going to look gorgeous. But I highly doubt you're going to have the person looking at your home say, you know, I would have bought that house if it had a beveled edge. You know, it's just, it's easy. That's an easy thing to remove that we won't impact the overall design concept too much. That'll help us on cost. That's something that you can definitely bring up. But again, hopefully you, you've gone over and you've done this negotiation successfully, or maybe they've just signed the check for you because you've done a good job at presenting price, building value, going over all the specifics, creating an urgency scenario. Hopefully you've done all that, but you want to make sure you do this cool down as well. Now, there are a few different ways that you can do a cool down. I would just sit down and sign the check and I would just say, look, there is this is going to look gorgeous. I have to have some pictures of this. As you can see, all these pictures that we looked at, how do you think we got those? Well, we take them after we've done it. You know, we're just proud of our work. So I can't wait to come take yours. Are you open to having a dinner party at your house if, if our company will sponsor it? You know, are we, um, you know, when are you, when's your next big uh, holiday party? Can I come over and take some pictures? You know, not during the party, obviously, but you know that the house is going to be gorgeous during that time because they're straightening everything up and getting it ready for a big group, you know, to, to visit. So, you know, you really want to emphasize how awesome it's going to look, what a great decision they've made, how you're finally going to get it done. You're trying to kind of make them feel good and whole about the decision they've just made. If you just take their check that they just wrote and run out the door because you're like, oh, thank God, I got to get out of here before they change their mind. That's going to you're going to have a higher rescission rate because, again, you need to cool down with the customer, reemphasize how awesome this this project is. It's going to look and and how they're going to be so happy that it's done. And again, um, you do that and you're going to have a lower rescission rate. You won't have a lot of cancellations. You know, I all honestly, if you do negotiate and bring down price, I used to use the picture thing anyways. I would say, listen, as you know, you know, we're already as low as we usually get. Um, but my owner's willing to come down to your $13,000 to make this a go, a green light. But he does have some conditions. You probably won't care about them. One of them is you don't ever share price. Obviously, we don't want you referring someone to us and then them expecting to get the same exact deal you got because obviously we got a pretty unique scenario here with the bulk rate for the commercial project. 
Number two is that you allow us to take and use some pictures of your project because it's going to look awesome and we want to show it off to our new uh, potential clients. You know, So are you okay with us coming to take some pictures after? And I'll take my before pictures right now. If you'll sign off here, take an initial down at the bottom saying that you authorize us using those, we're in good shape. You don't have to do a big formal document. I would just write down at the bottom in the notes, customer approves the use of pictures and let them initial right there. So give, give them a justification and a reason why they're willing to drop prices big. And then again, once you've negotiated, it's especially important that you do the cool down. Now, another method that was used, not by myself, but by another sales professional in our organization, he used to have them write on the folder three reasons why they're moving forward with us as their option. The three things they like the most about our option. Maybe it was no demolition. Maybe it was lifetime warranty. Maybe it was the color. Maybe it was me. <laughs> Who knows? You know, whatever it was, they write it down on their folder. So guess what they have to do? Let's say a customer is teetering on the fence, maybe going to call and cancel, maybe not. Well, where are they going to get the number? Well, now they're going to get it on Google Maps, of course, or some phone, smartphone thing. But most of the time, they are going to open and look at the folder. So you open it up. You got your three reasons looking at them right in the face on the sleeve of that folder saying, I did this because it has a lifetime warranty. I did this because it wasn't going to be, you know, there was no demolition. I did this because Matt is so awesome. <laughs> did one of those three things. So you're giving them a reminder as to why they move forward with the project. So again, I'm going to have a, I know that this is a very condensed version of training, especially since we can dedicate probably a half hour to each one of these bullet points easily. But, um, you know, a lot of your learning needs to be uh, in the field. You know, I'm here to help coach with stuff that you're struggling with. All I can offer as a recommendation is make sure that you are paying attention to your mistakes and your failures, okay? So you're not going to – a rock star in our system, a dean a dean in the system in, in Arkansas, he still gets 40 to 50% of people that say no thanks. And he's a rock star. He's really good. All right? When I was at my peak – I was closing at maybe a 60%, 55 to 60% rate. Maybe a bad month would have been 40, 45. But that means you are an, a rock star if you get half the people you meet say no. But it's important what you do with those half the people that, that are saying no. If, if they're saying no, you got to dissect why did they say no? Oh, they guessed $2,000. Okay, well, I need to spend more time on my my building of value or my my price expectations, my price conditioning. Oh, I couldn't get them to decide between two colors. Well, you need to work on getting them down to one color. Oh, I botched this or botched that. Pay attention to your failures. I have two boys that play baseball and I coach them. And I always tell them, mistakes are awesome. <laughs> you know, it's okay to make them because you learn something from the mistake. If you don't win a sale, you don't sell it. You, there's a reason. Some are unavoidable and you can't help, but you can do some self-reflection and figure out, wow, I'm getting a lot of pushback on price. Well, you that's a reflection on you. You need to spend more time on price conditioning, building value. Does that make sense? I agree. Yeah. So again, you guys have some pre-work or some paperwork and follow up, uh, follow through and homework. So the assigned homework, that's really just to calculate this, this program at one point we had, you know, high expectations that we would be able to talk and, you know, do things with you throughout the first week. But we realized every franchise has a different schedule and sometimes they don't start people on the same day and all that. So um, we're just going to give some generic homework and that is uh, measure your kitchen, measure the showroom kitchen. Measure anything that you can get your hands on and get proficient in measuring. So make sure you're you're not, again, having that hold you up. Secret shop your competitors. You need to ask your local franchise owner who your big competitors are and go visit their establishment. Don't wear Granite Transformations or Trend Transformations logo wear, but go visit them and understand what your customers are going through. 
know what their experience is because that is is going to ring so true to them. If you talk to them and you know what they've already seen, that's powerful. We had a couple of cheap Chinese companies in the market, and I, I secret shopped them. And again, I, it was so awesome because I could talk to them. If they said, oh, yeah, I had l and &E, I'm like, man, that showroom's rough, isn't it? And it's crazy. They only have like five or ten colors that are really that cheap price that they advertise. Really, the rest of them are at some yard somewhere that isn't anywhere close. They couldn't even speak English or whatever it was. You know what I mean? I was using my knowledge because I secret shopped and I knew exactly what their experience was. So secret shop your opponents. Shadow salespeople. That's a given. You guys sound like you're all doing that. Now, the, I'm a big proponent of this last one because if you're not from this industry, you need to understand how we make our product more than just seeing a video of how the slabs are made. So if you have a fabrication shop on site, you need to spend, if you can, spend at least an appointment or you know a day, if you can, with the back of the house. Maybe run out on a template with someone and just be quiet, see how it's done, understand how it's done. In the shop, you need to see how they make a countertop. We used to actually make our sales reps make a little corner piece so they understood how to make a countertop. Glenn, do you guys ever do that, or did you ever do that in Knoxville or no? Yeah, yeah, we used to uh, we used to have them make their edge samples. Good. Um, you know, in the shop. Also, we always recommended going down on an install. Yep. Just to be, you know, if they sold the job, just stop in there, visit with their with the customer, say hello. Uh, see the you know watch the guys install for a few minutes and you know just sort of get a general idea of what the guys have to go through and the challenges they face. Yeah, it's key and um, it's something that I always remind people at this stage in the process is treat this as if it is your business. This is your business. So when you spend a day in the shop or on a template or building a piece, it's easy as a salesperson to see. Well, I'm not going to make any commission if I do that. You know, it's it's not something that I'm going to make money on today, but it's going to help you make money tomorrow because you're going to have a better understanding of how the process works. You're going to make you're going to catch a mistake that could cost you a job. You, you're going to spend more time on working on your your expertise in our company, and all of the great ones know it. Dean knows. The internet. He was an installer, I think, first. So he knows. Yeah, Glenn. He was an installer. He was a back of the house shop manager, I think, too. He knows our company inside out. The ones that are experts do the best in our company. So make yourself an expert. Spend the time. Invest the money. Invest the time. Put some sweat equity into this this sucker, and you'll you'll do quite well. So any other questions that you guys have? I'm gonna make sure I'm not missing anything real quick. Yeah, this just gives you kind of a, a general outline of kind of in my dream world what you guys should be doing. So it's not the end of the world, you know, going on some sales calls. This is all part of the homework that was just assigned. Uh, again, if you don't have an iPad, an iPhone, or a Mac, I would highly recommend you go buy one. And I know that's tough if you've just started a job. If your franchise doesn't provide you with one, uh, you can go on Groupon and get an iPad that's a few generations old for a very small investment. I mean, it's maybe, I don't know, 150 200 bucks. Go on eBay, figure it out. Um, work out a payment plan with your owner if you need to. I don't know what you need to do, but get an iPad. That's kind of an industry standard. Not an Android tablet or anything like that. Just get something that you can at least participate in our photos program and when we come out with a new app eventually down the road, it's going to be just for Mac most likely as well, so or for iOS devices. So make sure that uh, you spend some money on yourself and, and work out whatever you need to with your owner. Invest in yourself in this company and treat it like it's your business and you'll do well. All right, last call. Anyone? Where do we find uh, all of these pictures and all of this information? Most of your crew in Phoenix has them already, uh, but all you need to do is, is uh, on top of having an Apple device, is you just send me an email saying add me to the list. Your first email will be a, uh, a, a how-to, if you will. It'll have a YouTube link, which is going to be a tutorial on how to make sure the settings are correct on your device. 
And then you just simply, you're going to get about 20 emails from me or 25 that's going to ask you to subscribe and you just click the button subscribe. And as long as your device is set up right, it will automatically download everything for you. And as I add more pictures, it will automatically update and add the pictures to your iPad or iPhone or whatever you're using. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Yes, Matt, earlier when we first started, you mentioned that there were some high profile jobs in Tennessee. Mm -hmm. Remember? So for yours, um, I believe yours, we had, um, I want to say it was an airport. Hold on, let me pull up the list real quick. Uh, sorry, it's it's listed somewhere. So we, I think we did a um, a hospital. You guys have HCA and stuff like that hospitals nearby. I think their headquarters is in Nashville, actually. So there were some hospitals that were done. There was also, I think, might have been a restaurant down there. Hold on just a second. I'm going to try and pull it up, see if I can find it on my list. Substance such a variable. Mm. Uh, the ones that you can use, obviously, that are uh, outside of your area that well, you, you want if you want some local ones, I'll have to send you an email. I don't know, I can't find it on my device right now. I don't know where it's at. But I have a big reference list that actually goes over some of our, our high profile projects. Um, but again, the ones that are universal that work all over is we're in the Hawaii Honolulu Airport, we're in the LAX airport, um, we, we're we're in countless you know, hotels, you, you know. Uh, movie theaters. We've done artistic projects all over the world. We're in Dow Agro in uh, Indianapolis. You know, we've got so many. I mean, they're countless. Pools all over the world. I mean, you name it. We're and of course, you saw in that video that you know, if you have a very religious person, you know, you can go over their church, the churches, all of the uh, cathedrals and stuff like that in in uh, Europe. You know, that's that's big. And I can send you those videos if you if you guys want them. I can upload them onto a WeTransfer, and you can download those the same exact videos you saw for the mosaics. So it'll kind of showcase some of them there as well. I think I have those videos on my laptop. Okay. Um, that we saw today, but I would like to have a list if it's not too much trouble of the you know high profile. Yeah. Because I like to throw that out there. I think it helps, you know, build credibility. Yeah, we update it on a pretty regular basis, too. And I can't believe I can't find it. Um, just one sec. Let me look one more time. And it might be in one folder that just popped to mind. Uh, Terrazzo Project page. All right, so this might be it. This might be an old one or it might be a new one. All right. So we're in. Okay, is that something you can email me, or do I need to get ready to write really fast? You write really fast? No, I'm just kidding. Uh, it'll. Uh, oh yeah, we're on tons of cruise ships too, cruise liners. So that's a good one. Um, these are looking like a lot in Honolulu, Connecticut, Michigan, D.C., Canada, Virginia, Maryland, Texas. Yeah, so this page is nice. I mean, this is a good one. It shows healthcare, education, airports, different places that we've installed. So, yeah, I absolutely can send this document. So, why don't I uh, do this? I'm going to open a secondary we transfer. And do me a favor. Everybody that's on this call, especially ones that want this, send me an email that requests, that requests this information if you want it. And I'll put one we transfer link together that'll have all three videos, and it'll have this uh, this pro special projects page uh, on it. We actually have a whole catalog for special projects, but this this page is easier. It's more simplistic. You can just look at a list. So thank you, thank you so much. Jason is sending you an email now, and he will distribute it to us. So thank you so much. I appreciate your help. No problem. Anyone else questions? No? No. All right. So we do a top 10 or a top performers list every month on our Zoom calls. 
So uh, I want to see it. I want to see Kelly. I, you got to be putting up some Dean like numbers. I got to see Doug. <laughs> there. Yeah, I got to see Amy. I got to see all you guys put up, and, and I want to see at least 100K. You'll be on the list if you get at least 100 grand in production. And I just want to make sure everyone knows that that's not out of reach. Obviously, it's um, it, it's very doable. So make sure you guys are out there kicking butt. And I want to see uh, I want to see some new names on there. I'm sick of seeing all the Northern California folks up there all the time. And Dean. Thank all right. you. All right. We'll talk to you guys later. Bye. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Thank you.